King, then you get to Shmuel. Uh, and the reason, so it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting. The Torah, when it talks about appointing the king, uses the exact same ver the exact same verbiage uh, whenever the people ask Shmuel for a king. Or right, so they they come. They said, "Appoint for us a king like the nations." Right, and so the Torah was actually foreshadowing what they were going to do in the time of the prophet Shmuel. Uh, the reason why it was not, how do I say, for, I guess frowned upon, for lack of a better word, is because the way in which they were asking. Samuel, in all intents and purposes, was like like a king, right? Uh, he was ruling on behalf of Hashem, even though he really wasn't, he didn't really have the kingship, and it wasn't David's time yet. And so they prematurely asked for a king, even though David was not in the picture yet. Uh, so, and the Davidic dynasty and all that. So the, um, and I'm not sure if this answers your question, but but essentially it's, it's the way in which they asked him well. They didn't want, they wanted a king solely for the purpose of, hey, we want to be like the nations, which is what the verse states in the Torah too, in in, Shof, in Parsha Shoftim, and so it wasn't it wasn't with the same, it wasn't for the intention of fulfilling the mitzvah of appointing the king for the Torah's sake. They were wanting to appoint the king. We're like, hey, we want to we want to go and have a king like the nations. Like specifically, we want to imitate the Gentiles. Uh, so they were asking for all the wrong reasons, and this is why Hashem tells Samuel, "It's not you that they're rejecting, Samuel. They're rejecting me." Right. Because they're not even at this point, they're just wanting to imitate the Gentiles. The intention behind of what they were trying to do was to imitate the Gentiles. So I don't know if that that answers your question. I hope it does. Uh, there's a whole lot more if you're looking for more answers in uh, Sefer, Art Scrolls, um, volumes on the mitzvot. So there's a lot, definitely a lot more answers there. It was a problem with intention. Cool. Very fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. That, that coupled with, it wasn't time for them to have a King yet. I mean, Samuel was in place of the King until, until David's time. And then they got, um, so, uh, King show. So. I'm going to go and get my commentary on Zachariah. Because, man, that's been bothering me since the beginning of the Zoom, uh, the Zechariah 13, 8. So I have a feeling I'm going to be doing a lot of this because all my books are across the room. And just so everyone knows, um, this is a pretty open format now. So whatever topics we want to discuss or sources we want to go over, we can uh, throw them in the chat or call them out. So no, no order now. We're all structure free. Hopefully everyone has had a beautiful meal. If you haven't, definitely do it or go to sleep. <laughs> Uh, or stay awake. <laughs> All right, Zachariah, where are you? Here. Yep, there's Zachariah. So here's my source, just so everyone knows, Treasar, volume two. And I think it's interesting, too, because uh, Zachariah is where we get the Elenu from. So to ask if uh, the one third of the population is about the Jewish people or the whole entire world, I think is a, just an astounding question. Okay, so here's what the commentary says. Zechariah foretells of great destruction that will take place before the coming of the Messiah. At that time, two-thirds of those residing in the land of Israel will perish. Some by the sword, some by a plague, and one-third of the people will survive. 
That's from the Radak. And then it goes on to say, alternatively, two thirds of the entire world population will perish at that time. So even before getting the commentaries out between everyone who commented on this passage, I think we both came, we all came to the same conclusion. So one th two thirds of the entire world population will perish at that time. The two thirds that will perish are the Edomites and the Ishmaelites. Literally says Christians and Muslims. And the third that will survive are the Israelites. That is from the Medzudot. Now, mind you, that in Avodah Zarah, it says, yeah, okay, so those who are uh, descendants of Esau will be wiped out, like the house of Esau will be wiped out. But it says those who act like Esau. So we should be mindful that those who are acting in ways that are contrary to the standards of Hashem, i.e. those who are rebellious, those who are uh, not wanting to repent, those who harden their hearts like Pharaoh did, I would push more towards that opinion as opposed to just saying, you know, oh yeah, Christians and Muslims are going to go away. And again, this is only one opinion. So <laughs> um, the next one says, alternatively, one third of the nations will convert to Judaism and thereby survive. So the whole verse is actually not talking about all who are going to perish as opposed to all who are going to convert. So basically, two thirds of the world will not convert to Judaism, not necessarily meaning that they're going to be wiped out or perish. And this is from Rashi. So every tree that doesn't produce fruit worthy of repentance shall be thrown in the furnace. And again, you know, um, one of the things we have to take into account is there is judgment coming. You know, like, because there have been things that have to, unfortunately, there are consequences for many actions that have been taken, you know, even in our own lives, even, as we talked about, like our soul goes to heaven to give an account for things that we, it is done, you know, so there's lots of things that uh, have to happen, you know, we can't just look at God as like, oh, I'm just going to overlook all those times you kill people, like, no, that's, there is balancing the scales that have to happen. A lot of this, what's cool is a lot of this can be taken care of now with the struggles, the trials that we go through in our life. Sicknesses, pains, chaspe shalom, but death, death is an, a, a huge atonement for everyone. Um, also, uh, people who die as martyrs um, and people who die fighting to protect the land of Israel that's a big atonement as well, even if they're religious or not. Um, uh, and, and I'm talking as far as the, uh, the effect of observance of Torah. There's a whole chapter on this in the Handbook of Jewish Thought, Volume 2. But um, also anything you do, like stubbing your toe, uh, <laughs> all these different things that happen that are challenges and difficulties for you, these are aspects of atonement. Because we learned that Hashem, when he punishes, he breaks it up. So he doesn't do it all at once. So there's way more hope that we have than to just think massive destructions and wiping out of civilization and, uh, you know, great catastrophes and natural disasters. Yes, those have happened. Some of the things may possibly still happen. But the sages actually teach us not to focus on that. Don't focus on the negative. Don't focus on the bad. Don't focus on the judgment. Focus on sweetening, mitigating the judgment. This is why the Messiah tells us we're salt and light, because salt is an aspect of preserving, and it also draws out impurity. Light also dispels darkness. You know, it makes new creation. It makes all things new, you know, and when the light is shown, when darkness is exposed, this is an opportunity when things in our lives are brought to light. Confess it. Don't hold on to it. Don't be found in the light with horrible things and then just be like, oh, yeah, or make excuses or things like that. The reason the light shines is for us to actually give it up, you know, and so these are the beautiful things that uh, that we can do 
uh, as opposed to just kind of looking at a doom and gloom type format. And um, and we also learned that if a prophet prophesies something negative that will happen, it doesn't have to come true because negative decrees can be torn up. So uh, it, it speaks to in Judaism as well that if you change your name, if you change your location, people who get married, you know, uh, things like this, uh, people who give charity, these wipe out and tear up evil decrees. So there are many different ways that we don't just have to look at Zechariah 13, 8 is like, is it this or is it that, you know, like a black and white thing? So um, according to Reish Lakish, it says, this verse means that only one third of the Jewish nation will survive these days. Rabbi Yochanan disagrees and interprets that all Jewish people will survive. See Sanhedrin 111a. So anyway, so Dr. J, I see you're still here, Baruch Hashem. That was like, I was like fiending for this book. I was like, I got to go get the commentary. <laughs> so... Thank you. Yeah, I pulled it off my shelf and I'm reading along with you and I thank <laughs> you for pointing me to it. All right. Yeah, gotta love the sources. Um... Trying to think, what does it say for the Eleni? Where is it sourced? Let's see here. Uh, Zechariah fourteen nine. So not even like a full chapter later, we get into uh, the Elenu prayer. And this is the prayer where it says that every knee will bend and every tongue will confess. You know, so like this is a, a really huge thing as far as like a global accepting of the sovereignty of Hashem that will happen. So it says, all the surviving nations that attack Jerusalem will acknowledge that God is king over the entire world once they have seen the great miracles that he performed for his nation. This is from Radak and Abarbanel. His kingship will no longer be recognized only by Israel, but by all the nations. And that's Abarbanel. Now, here's the amazing thing about this. We learned that when you accept the king over you, it's also an atonement for your sins. So the whole entire world gets to have this aspect of uh, forgiveness because they accept Hashem's kingship. It's not ideal that you accept his kingship on the back end of, uh, I had to see something in order to be like, oh yeah, sure. You know, but uh, the other thing that makes me think of is Paro himself, Pharaoh is a prototype of the nations accepting Hashem's kingship and sovereignty. Because remember, Pharaoh was like, I don't know this God. I'm not going to listen to him. It's not in any of my books. And then the splitting of the sea happens. And then he has a come to Hashem moment, you know? And so that's like a, uh, an indicator of something that's going to happen globally. And what's really amazing about this time that the world is going through, it's so turbulent right now. It's so disheartening in, in so many ways that there's a breaking down that's happening to where it's almost like mankind is being forced to say, you know, are you going to look up? Are you going to like realize you need something bigger than yourself? You know, people who relied on their their tactics of, uh, you know, survival and uh, what do they call it preppers like people who prep 
for all these disasters, you know, all these things and all the governments that are collapsing, all of the, the major leaders who are stepping down from their position, this is like a big setup, you know, because ultimately Hashem is going to reign supreme. Um, real quick, Isaiah 66, 23, all mankind will come to prostrate before him and Shira has her hand up. Yes, I have a question. Mm -hmm. In Asidur, it says that according to many early sources, among them, a Geonic response attributed the, to Rav Haigaon, Rokea, and Kobo. Joshua composed this declaration of faith and dedication after he led Israel across the Jordan, talking about the Elaine. During mm -hmm. the Talmudic era, it was part of the Rosh Hashanah Musaf service. And some point during medieval times, it became part of the daily service. And it goes on talking about it. So did they kind of merge Isaiah and how they all come together? Yes. Um... I love that it mentions the fact that uh, the Elenu became a custom uh, in the medieval times to actually be recited all the time because it usually only it used to in antiquity only be recited once a year. Um, mm -hmm. So as far as the merging there, we do have the fact that. Um, Isaiah 45, 23. Yeah, we have the Zechariah 14, and then we have Isaiah 45. So they are mm -hmm. both included and merged together, you know, as far as passages go. Mm -hmm. So your question was what again? Because it says there was Joshua who composed this declaration. Right. Yeah. And it also, um, you see the Hebrew of the second paragraph of the Elenu says Al Cain. Mm -hmm. So they say this is the passage of the Elenu that Achan from the Jericho account, he composed this part. So as we should all know, uh, many of the prophecies were quoted before they were actually written down. For instance, Psalm 92, you know, uh, this is the song of the Shabbat, you know, Mizmor Shir Leyom HaShabbat. That was uh, quoted by Adam, but it was written later by King David, you know, things like that. So when we're talking about Isaiah, talking about um, Zechariah, those people came way later, those prophets came way later than Joshua. However, mm -hmm. Joshua is composing things that they would prophesy about. So again, as we mentioned earlier, like there's a, the level of your soul outside of its body. There, it's not constrained by time. When we're talking about prophecy, it comes from the realm of spirit. That comes from a place where there is no time. So mm -hmm. as far as trying to look at it in a linear format, uh, this is where we would we would have to defer to the understanding that prophecy exists in the level of the spirit and it's outside of time. So even though Joshua wrote, wrote it in the Elenu, it was later prophesied by the prophets. Because remember, everything the prophets prophesied about was revealed at Mount Sinai, who mm -hmm. was also at Mount Sinai, Joshua. So he would have the potential to even pin fragments of the prophets before the prophets themselves, because he was directly at Mount Sinai, as opposed to being born later. Okay. Thank so just you. a kind of different dynamic. You got more? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So you're, you're welcome. Uh, Shomo. 
Um, I was just looking at the commentary on that prayer in my Siddur. Um, according to many early sources, among them, a geonic response and attributed to Rav Chai Chaon, Rokeach, and Kobo, Yehoshua composed the Declaration of Faith and Dedication after he led Israel across the Jordan. During the Talmudic era, it was part of the Rosh Hashanah Musaf service. And at some point during the medieval times, it became part of the daily service. Ba Orach Kaim 133 explains that Aleinu was added to the daily prayers to instill faith in the oneness of God's kingship and the conviction that he will one day remove detestable idolatry from the earth, thus preventing Jews from being tempted to follow the beliefs and lifestyles of the nations among whom they dwell. See Ehun Tefillah and uh, Emek uh, Barakah. As we can surmise from its authorship and its placement at the conclusion of every service, its significance is profound. Its first paragraph, Aleinu, proclaims the difference between Israel's concept of God and that of other nations. Mm. The second paragraph, al Khan expresses our confidence that all humanity will eventually recognize his sovereignty and declare its obedience to his commandments. This, however, does not imply belief or even a hope that they will convert to Judaism. Rather, they will accept him as the only God and obey the universal Noachite laws that are incumbent upon all nations, Rav Hurst. Um, our portion, our lot, God does not punish non-Jewish nations until they have reached a full quota of sin, beyond which he no longer extends mercy. Then he brings retribution upon them, often destroying them totally. Such powerful ancient empires as Egypt, Persia, Greece, Rome, and Carthage have ceased to exist or have become insignificant. God does not act in this way with regard to Israel, however. The world survives whether or not there is a Roman Empire. But the world could not survive without Israel. Therefore, God punishes Israel in stages so that it will never be destroyed. Sayah Yeshak. And then you are to know Yadata Hayom. You are to know this day and take to your heart. The masters of Musar explained that an abstract belief in God does not suffice to make people observe the mitzvot properly. After obtaining knowledge, we must take it to heart, that is, develop a sincere commitment to act upon the knowledge. And then Al Ken, therefore, we put our hope in you, having stated that God chose us from among all the nations to serve him. We are entitled to hope that he will speedily reveal his greatness and rid the earth of spiritual abomination. This paragraph, like Elenu, begins with the Hebrew letter Ayin and ends with the letter Dalet, which combined to form the word Aid, indicating that Al Ken uh, Nekave, therefore we put our hope in you, continues the idea of being witness that we begun the Elenu since witnesses give testimony standing, standing. One stands both for Elenu and for Al Ken, uh, Nekave, uh, Kafa Chaim 132.15. So you mentioned the fullness of the nations. And that immediately made me think of Romans 11, 25, where it says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Now, what's amazing about this is it can also be understood on the level of until the fullness of the judgment of the nations has been brought in. Because again, as we read about the whole perishing and the plagues and the who will survive, who will not, a part of that and underneath that all is who is actually gonna convert? Who's actually gonna join the nation of Israel? So the double-sided aspect of the fullness of the nations also has to do with you know, their judgment uh, being 
filled up as far as the scales go. And then in the Secrets to the Redemption book, uh, this beautiful book, it says on page 63, the Ramban and Kitve HaRamban, Shir HaSharim 8, uh, volume 2, page 516, comments that a long time will pass after the end gathering of the exiles before all of Israel does Teshuva. Now, the end gathering of the exiles has to do with there's also Israel among the nations because some of the nations are destined to convert to Judaism. So <clears throat> that's uh, amazing that that's a part of the commentary on the prayer of the Elenu. Reminds me of another prayer that requires a minion, and that is me uh, komka malkenu. Can you um, translate that? Uh, from your place, our king. Um, the Kedusha. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, but specifically, it's referred to as Mim Komkoma. Uh, oh, Malkainu. Malkainu. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that part that Hillel does, uh, the, really, it's really long and beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. that we all want to sing. Yeah. 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 God of it. It's like, shh. <laughs> That's the Hazan's part. <laughs> but the, this prayer goes, and to be completely honest, it's my favorite on Shabbat. I don't see this in, in every Siddur, though. Um, it goes, we shall sanctify your name in this world just as they sanctified in heaven above, as is written by your prophet, one angel will call to another and say, holy, holy, holy is Hashem, master of legions, the whole world is filled with his glory. That's present in the Amidah under the section Kedusha, Hashem. Then with the sound of a great noise raising themselves from the seraphim, those facing him say, blessed, blessed is the glory of Hashem from his place, me call Momo. From your place, our king, you will appear and reign over us, for we await you. When will you reign in Zion? Soon, in our days, forever and ever, may you dwell there. May you be exalted and sanctified within Jerusalem, your city, from generation to generation and for all eternity. May our eyes see your kingdom as it is expressed in the songs of your might, written by David, your righteous anointed. Hashem will reign forever, your God, O Zion, from generation to generation. Hallelujah. And that last part is taken from uh, Isaiah 52. So yeah. another aspect of Mashiach coming and the final redemption is when the whole world sanctifies his name. Instead of desecrating that is starting to happen. Yeah. All right. Shlomo bin Halel. Okay, because this was bothering me too, the whole thing. So I could not find where they were disciples of Abraham. So I don't know where I read that at, but I know I read it somewhere. But I did find where Balaam actually comes from, and he's got a crazy story. Uh dude is manipulative as it is <laughs> um, <laughs> the only gentile prophet yeah basically like uh he is for, according this is from legend of the jews uh so this is a sex under a section of abraham uh, but it talks about the last few years of abraham this what it's titled under at least the section is titled the last few years of abraham uh, says this, it says, Rebecca first saw Isaac as he was coming from the way of Be'er Laharoi, the dwelling place of Hagar, where, where he had gone after the death of his mother for the purpose of returning his father with Hagar, or as she is also called, Keturah. Hagar bore him six sons who, however, did scant honor to their father, for they were all idolaters. 
Avraham, therefore, during his own lifetime, sent them away from the presence of Yitzhak, that they may not become singed by Yitzhak's flame, given the instruction to journey eastward as far as possible. There he built a city for them, surrounded by an iron wall, so high that the, that the sun could not shine into the city. But Avraham provided them with huge gems and pearls, their lustre more brilliant than the light of the sun, which will be used in the messianic time when the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed. Also, Avraham taught them the black art, wherewith they held sway over demons and spirits. It is from this city in the east that Laban, Balaam, and Balaam's father, Beor, derived their sorceries. Ephor, one of the grandsons of Abraham and Keter, invaded Libya with an armed force and took possession of the country. From this Ephor, the whole land of Africa has its name. Aram is also a country made habitable by, kin by kinsmen of Abraham. In his old age, Terach contracted a new marriage with Pelea, and from this union sprang a son, Zoba, who, had, who was the father in turn of these three, of their, of three sons. The oldest, the oldest of these, Aram, was exceedingly rich and powerful, and, and the old home in Haran sufficed not for him and his kinsmen. The sons of Nahor, the brother of Abraham, Aram, the brother of Abraham, Aram and his brother, and then all that belonged to him, therefore departed from Haran. But they settled in Valais, and they built a city themselves there, which they called Aram Zobah, to perpetuate the name of the father and his firstborn son. Uh, so basically it goes into this whole thing, but that's basically what they say here. Later on, uh, picks up Balaam's story, and I'm I'm kind of kind of it had to piece it together because it's all over in the legend of the Jews. But basically there is another section where how Balaam actually ends up in Egypt. It's this whole big long war with the children of Israel and with, with really Joseph capturing um, Zepho, this Edomite king, bringing him to justice in Egypt. Uh, Balaam then sides with them. There's this whole war between the, the Edomites and the, B'nai Israel in Egypt while Joseph was still alive. This was after uh, this was after they buried Yaakov. So after they buried Yaakov, this whole war broke out between them and the children of, of Asaf because they decapitated their father Asaf <laughs> when they were burying Yaakov. Uh, so yeah, it's a crazy story, but essentially he in he basically ends up in Egypt from that. So he was he was 15. According to this, he was 15 at the time of that war. So I don't know how old he was um, prior then. So yeah, he was a pretty old guy. So I don't know if that helps, but I was trying to find where it actually talked about them talking about uh, them being disciples of, of Abraham, but I can't find it. <clears throat> I have Shahar Papesu team open up to Balak, <clears throat> and the Ari's got a lot to say about about him. Does it talk about the uh, the fact that he's from the school of Abraham? Um, the Ari says there are nine names of Balak and Balaam. Because I'll write that on one level, Balak was second to Balaam. But on the, another level, Balaam was second to Balak. The Zohar also speaks about the matter of Balak and Balaam extensively, that because Balak was called Ben Sipor, son of a bird, he was very knowledgeable magician by means of a bird. And we know that the Egyptians worship birds, animals, you know. Uh, we see that their extreme hatred of the Jewish people was baseless. This is different from other anti-Semites, except for Amalek, who was also a big hater of the Jewish people. Therefore, I want to establish the matter here based upon the statement of Sefer HaZohar 
and Parsha Balak, page 199b, row 23. It says, Dovid HaMelech said, For behold, the wicked tread the bow. They set their arrow, etc. to Helam 11.2. And even though this verse, they Kazal said that the letters of Amalek can be divided into Ayin Mem, which spells the word Am, people. And Lamed, Kuf, whipped, Lek, indicating that they are the nation that whipped. Bala can be divided like this. Beit Aleph, Bo, he came, and Lamed Kuf whipped the name Bilam. Also can be divided into Beit Lamed without and Aimem nation, which letters remain from the combination of Balak and Bilam. Aimem Kuf, depth. Indicating that he, God, uh, Bill Bell confounded the depth of their Balak and Bilam thought so that they would no longer have power or remain in the world. This is what it, the Zohar, says. And then the section on the Arab Rav, this all has to do with the reincarnation of their souls and their roots. Amalek is the evil waste of Zuhama that was separated out from the soul of Cain. This is why I brought up the Gematria earlier of Hevel and Korach. This has a lot to do with that. <clears throat> um, yeah, out of, from the soul of Cain, the son of Adam HaRishon, he is one of the five levels of the Arab Rav that became mixed together with the Jewish people, which are the Amalekim, Rephaim, etc., mentioned in the Zohar in Parashat Bereshit. There was also the evil from Cain and Hevel in the Arab Rav. Therefore, Amalek is the greatest hater of the Jewish people, as it later says on the verse, the Kenites separated from among the Amalekites, 1 Samuel 15, 6. The good, the soul of Cain, was separated out and went to Yitro, who was called Hever, Hakini. He was separated from Cain, that is from the evil of Cain, which is Amalek. In other words, when this relates to when Moshe slew the Egyptian, when he invoked the 42 letter name of Hashem in doing so, in doing so, he allowed a reconciliation between him and Yitro, which is one of the reasons why Yitro converted. He came over to Judaism. Because he, if I remember the soul roots correctly, he had the, uh, the neshama of Cain. Um, See, the evils of Balak and Balaam. Balak and Balaam were a combination of two evils, from the evil of Cain and from the evil of Hevel. Therefore, they each have two letters, Beit Lamed, in their names from Hevel, as explained previously on the verse, an angel of God appeared to him in a flame of fire from within the bush, etc. Shemot 3.2. Only the final hay in Moshe's name had been separated out from Hevel and was in him the good and Hevel given to Moshe. The two letters, however, of Lamed and Beit of Hevel, representing the evil and Hevel, had not been separated out. They were given to Balak and Bilam, resulting in the word Beit Lamed, Beit Lamed, Bilam. The evil of Cain was also mixed into them and was alluded to in our names, in their names. As mentioned previously, the evil of Cain was Amalek. The first three letters of which are Ayin, Mem, Lamed. They were given to and included in the name Bilam. The remaining Kuf was given to and included in the name Balak. However, though Balak and Bilam had evil from both Cain and Hevel, the main part of Balak was the evil of Cain, and the main part of Bilam was from Hevel. The story of Balak is alluded to in the verse, and Balak, the son of Zippor, saw from Midbar 22.2. He was the son of Yitro, of whom it says, even a bird, Zippor, found a house. To Helam 84.4, this refers to Yitro, the father of Zippor, the wife of Moshe, as mentioned in the Zohar, Parashah Balak 196b. Yeah, there's a lot more. <laughs> um, 
It says there that Yitro took the good part of Cain's soul and became a pure bird. The evil was given to her seed. Balak, who was the descendant of Yitro, as mentioned there, it was explained that the neshama of Cain was given to Yitro. Okay, good. I remember that right. <laughs> and that the Ruach of Cain went to Shmuel, Hanavi. The matter of Belam has been explained in several places how his main part was from Hevel. Uh, Besod, there never arose another prophet from the Jewish people like Moshe, Devarim 34.10. The Midrash explains that one never arose from the Jewish people, but one did arise from the nations of the world, who? Belam. It should be interesting to note that one of the oldest prayers in the Siddur and is normally recited on Shabbat is Matova Oha Leka Yaakov. Mishken Oteka Yisrael, out of the mouth of a pagan wizard, comes one of the oldest uh, blessings or prayers in the Siddur. Whether or not he has, I don't. Whether or not he has sufficient merit for the, to remain alive, it, apparently not, because he met his fate later on in Sefer Bamidbar. So it's also been explained on the verse, behold, Milka, she also bore sons to Nahor, your brother, Bereshit 2220, that the head letters of the Hebrew words for sons to Nahor are the name Hevel. This hints that Lavan, the son of Betuel, the army, was from Hevel. The entire family was from him, as explained in Parashat uh, Tisa regarding the incident of the calf. Laban himself in particular reincarnated into Bilaam. So Bilaam is, is the Gilgal for Laban. But this goes on. So if anyone has anything else they'd like to share. All right, so Balaam is a descendant of Nahor. So uh, that's that's kind of something else I was looking for too. So to answer, I don't know if she's still here, but Dr. J, uh, Legends of the Jews says this, says, uh, talking about Balaam's course of life and his actions uh, show convincingly why God withdrew from the heathens to give the prophecy for Balaam was the last of the heathen, heathen prophets. It says the prophets that labored after him among the heathens were Job and his four friends, Eliphaz, Zophar, Bildad, and Elihu, as well as Balaam, all of whom were descendants of Nahor, Abraham's brother from his union with Milcha. So there it is. <clears throat> yeah, that the legends of the Jews, I just keep hearing excerpts all the time, and I don't, I don't have, a, I've never really gotten access to it. I'm going to see here. Let's see if I could do this. Well, starting the RE helps, which is what I've been doing for quite some time now. Um, and then reading uh, Shahar Ha Gilgalim as well also helps um, the chapter on soul roots in that book
Yeah, another element to this is also in Bear Sheet 3119 uh, and Ra Raquel stole her father's teraphim. <clears throat> Referring to uh, Levon. Well, I guess I'll read some more. <laughs> Location of Balak. It's necessary to know how Balak is mixed together with Balaam. It has been explained on the verse, and Raquel stole her father's teraphim, Bereshit 31.19, that the middle third of Tiferet of Zer, the chest and place of the revelation of the light of the Yesod of Ema is where the Keter of Raquel begins on the backside of Zer. Within it are clothed the two heels of the feet of Leah, and that is the level of the teraphim that she stole. See there at length. There is a shorter version. It is known regarding that the sword of walking for Amos and Eretz Yisrael, that the illumination of the Kassadim and Gaburos of Yesod of Abba goes out to Leah as well. As known, Leah is from the Malkut of Ema inside Zer. And therefore, there are lights of Abba and Leah for the following reason. The head of Leah is in line with the back of the Da'at of Zer, which has the Yesod of Abba within it, with the lights of Kassadim and Gavros in it. The Yesod of Abba itself is clothed in the Yesod of Ema, which has other Kassadim and Gavros in it. The Yesod of Ema itself is clothed in the middle chamber of the skull of Zerampin, which is the Da'at. Thus, when the lights of Ema go out to Leah, they have to break through two barriers, the vessel of the Yesod of Ema and the vessel of the head of Zer, after they go to the outside and after the head of Leah, and then emanate her entire links to her heels clothed in the Keter of Raquel. It was explained there in the discussion about the teraphim that since it was the place of Leah's heels, who herself is completely judgment, being from small amounts of lights that go out from a place of covered lights and only through a crack, and specifically the level of the heels, they are strong judgment, and the clipos latch onto them. The lights from Ema that emanate to the heels of Leah break through the heels of Leah, and Bokim Pierce, the Keter of the head of Raquel entering it. The lights then go to the outside where the, the Kotsunim latch onto them. Yeah, this um, text of the Ari is uh, Pincus Winston. He's the one who translated it. I, I just saw Dr. J's comment there. So I'm just responding to that. You know all the all those
Does anybody have any questions that they were wanting to ask but didn't get a chance to ask? Is everyone familiar with the terminology that the Arizal uses? I would say probably not. <laughs> um, well, let me give you a quick um, um, lesson then. Um, I have a question. Does anyone want coffee? <laughs> uh, if we had a transporter, we send it to you. <laughs> Um, but is everyone familiar with the Ten Sefiro? I know Shlomo Arroyo is, and Emet is. Well, they know seven at least. Um, the Ten Sefiro being um, Gater, Hokma, Bina, Hesed, Gavura, Tiferet. Netzach, Hod, Yesod, and then uh, Malkut. <laughs> now, other Kabbalistic terminology that is used is we have uh, Ein Sof, which is the infinite nothingness. I could read from uh, Daniel C. Matt's book, The Essential Kabbalah, on that. Um, then there's Atik Yomin, which is the Ancient of Days. That term is found in, da in Daniel. Then there is the Or Ein Sof, the infinite light, which is basically the same as Ein Sof. There's no beginning, there's no end. It's self-existent, you know, aye, I share, aye, I will be who I will be, you know, Hashem's statement to Moshe. And then one of the earliest emanations that there are in Kabbalah is the Adam Kadmon, the primordial man. In many ways, this is Adam HaRishon before he to partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But even before this emanation, we have Simsum, where Hashem contracts himself, makes room for the physical space of creation. That's why we're here. It's because of that. And so from Adam, Adam Khan Mon, then we have the Sephiro, the intellectual the divine intellect consisting of the first three sephiro, which comprise, which are comprised of Keter, Hokma, and Bina. And then the next six, which comprise the Kabbalistic term Serampin, which means the short countenance, consists of the next six sephiro, which begins with Hased and goes all the way down to uh, Yasod. And then we have Malkut. So like what I read from the Ari here on the location of Balak when Raquel stole her father's teraphim and he refers to Tiferet of Zer, that's precisely what he means. And that the teraphim resided in Tiferet of Zer on Pim. Which represents the chest which is the place of the revelation of, of light of Yasod. Now, here's something else. The, the tree is divided. Malkut's the lowest. Yeah, Malkut derives all of its energy, all of its life from the other Sephiro. Um, but the tree, but the Sephira is also referred to as the tree of, tree of life in Kabbalah. It has three axes. 
the right axis is what's known as ABBA. And then you have the central axis where you have Tiferet. And then you have the, the left axis, which is Ema. So these are also terminology that the Arizal uses. Uh, Hokma is Abba, Ima is Bina. From Bina gives birth to all, to from wisdom. But the first Sephiro is like a starting point because that too is infinite. Because when the Ari says the Yesod of Ima, he's talking about that side of the Yesod that's divided up and is on the side of Ima, on the left side of the axis of the tree of life. And see, when he also says, and that's where the Keter of Raquel begins, meaning when we hit into Yesod, then it whole branches out a whole new uh, Sephiro. And it begins with Keter, and that's where the Ari says that Raquel can be found. That her crown, so to speak, begins. And then he says on the back side is there because Raquel and Leah are faced back to back, so to speak. So you take the two trees and you face them back to back. And see, when he says, you know, the backside, that's where within it are clothed the two heels of the feet of Leah. And that is the level of the teraphim. That's where the teraphim resides. So on the mystical level, Raquel takes the teraphim for Lamban. And it makes its way somehow to uh, Bilam because he draws upon this energy, so to speak, this uh, mystical energy. But it's not the same energy that the Kabbalists draw upon. Because like he said, this is the, the Black Arts, which is why his name, you know, uh, so you go back and page here, Balak, Balak son of Zippor. Basically, Ari treats them both as the same. You know, he's looking at two sides of the of the same coin, mystically speaking. Yeah, Ari's all. Uh, Isaac Luria is his full name. He's also known as Ari HaKadosh. And Ari is Hebrew for lion. Uh, a bit of history on the Ari. He was the student of uh, Moshe Cordovero, one of the leading Kabbalists in Spain in the 14th century. And then the main student of the Ari Zal was the, was Kayim uh, Vital, who actually wrote Shahar HaGilgalim and Shahar Ray. Uh, Kedusha, the Gates of Holiness. There's some other works attributed to him as well.
Uh, I wanted to continue with uh, Zechariah 14. It's just as far as uh, <laughs> what's the PDF download link for what? Oh, it's on uh, Telegram, Safari, uh, or it's called uh, Sephorim PDF. Okay, cool. All right, so um, speaking about the day where Hashem will become one, it says... All the nations will abandon false deities, their false deities, and acknowledge that Hashem is the only God and does not share his mantle with any other power. <clears throat> Why the tradition of staying up late? Because we were asleep when Hashem showed up on the mountain in Exodus chapter 19 and, and chapter 20. Moshe was told to tell us to get ready. Uh, we had to prepare ourselves for three days. So during this preparation process, at the end of it, Hashem was going to uh, meet us and give us the Torah. So we were asleep and he had the shofar blast, the thunder and the lightning, and it had to wake us up, basically. And so the staying up late is, um, is a tacoon for, you know, we want to be awake in the morning when Hashem shows up. So we don't know when he would show up. So if we're up already, then there you go. <laughs> yep, another tacoon for messing up, pretty much. <laughs> um, so yes, the Talmud in Pesachim 50a questions the meaning of this verse. It implies that God's unity will not be absolute until the ultimate redemption will have taken place on that day, Hashem will be one, implying not before that day. <clears throat> Rabbi Akabar Hanina explained that unlike in this world, where upon hearing good things, one relates the blessing of who is good and who does good, and upon hearing bad tidings, the true judge, which is the Baruch Diana Met, um, this may cause one to believe in plurality and God, for it is difficult to reconcile suffering and tragedy with God's attributes of mercy and kindness. In the world to come, all of the blessings will be who is good and who does good, for at that time, there will be no bad tidings. The unity of God will be fully acknowledged and appreciated. So I like reading this because every time we end our prayer services, we always end with the Elenu. And it's like this hope for uh, repair for the whole entire world, for all mankind. You know, there are so many different faith systems and religions that exist in the world. And it's like, it's awesome because all everyone ultimately will have the opportunity to recognize Hashem's oneness. And we can also see Hashem's oneness throughout the multifaceted um, variety, the spectrums, if you will, of people and of faiths, because many faiths all also teach the same truth. You know, this is why when you look at what the whole Noahide section of the Torah is, it's the common laws that all men have in, in, uh, in common. And so whether people are Torah observant or not, you know, we all know we shouldn't kill people, we shouldn't steal, you know, false witness and, and things like that. And so when we talk about the hope for Hashem's oneness to be made manifest in the world, it's like bringing mankind back to where we were before when we all spoke the pure language and when we all had an opportunity to be on the same page to serve Hashem. So if you think about the Tower of Babel, which is where everything went chaotic, even before that, obviously, but if we would have done that act to glorify God, to unify with him, how much power that would be, you know, that 
we built this physical structure that interface with the spiritual worlds and it would have been to bring Hashem's name glory as opposed to making glory for ourselves so you know I kind of think of it along that line when we talk about Hashem becoming one it's like what if the Tower of Babel would have been kosher you know and we wouldn't have wanted to make war on Hashem we weren't doing things out of fear you know and so um just kind of another perspective on looking at things and because i mentioned this earlier actually i want to go to the motion mashiach drop here Yeah, so <clears throat> this is the book I'm using right now, The Future, Rabbi Lawrence Hygia. Yeah, I got that on Kindle. <laughs> yeah, this is this is amazing. So what uh, chapter? I believe it's in chapter 11. But this is a this is a nuance. This isn't meant to be like a a literally like what is it? I've been starting in the Messiah text lately too. Oh yeah. Uh, this is on uh, chapter 11. The section is the return of prophecy to Israel and all the Jewish people. So I made the comment earlier that um, Mashiach won't be on a greater level of prophecy than Moshe because of the five books of Torah. Like the Mashiach's not going to come and bring like a whole new Torah or anything like that. He's going to expound on the Torah that we've already been given. So on a um, on one level, because there are other sources that talk about the Mashiach being more exalted and greater than Moshe. And it says that uh, Hashem will raise up a prophet like me and you shall listen to him in Deuteronomy. So this is one aspect of how the Mashiach is not going to do anything new, per se, that's going to uh, take away Moshe or the Torah, and also to give more weight to what the Mashiach says when he says, if you don't believe Moshe, how could you believe me, right? So it says that the Mashiach will be a prophet, second only in his prophet, prophetic ability to Moshe Rabbeinu. This is from Rabbi Hirsch on Psalms 34, 6. He says, however, before he arrives, he will be announced by Eliyahu, who is a prophet himself. And it says, uh, da, da, da. I'll just read this whole thing. This says that the prophets is the proof that before Mashiach actually arrives, prophecy will return to the Jewish people. As the final prophet, Malachi says in his final prophecy, behold, I send Eliyahu. And then that is Malachi 3.23. So this is a necessary, or this is necessary because Mashiach will be a king and a king can only be anointed by a prophet. The restoration of prophecy is a very important prelude to the arrival of Mashiach. So the talk of the coming of the Mashiach 
This refers to the moment when the Mashiach receives the spirit of prophecy and realizes his mission. Or somewhere it says it more explicitly in here, but anyway, uh, that would be the main part as far as the comment I made earlier is that the Mashiach is going to take us deeper into the Torah as opposed to give us something, you know, like new to start from that's different from what we already know. Yeah, that would be the job of Mashiach Ben Yosef. See if I can find it over here. Because that would be an aspect of the Elenu, is removing all idolatry. Yeah. Because the, uh, the other part about this is, I've never heard this before, you know, like, Mashiach will be second in the prophecy to um, Moshe Rabbeinu. Because <laughs> I was just like, wait, what? That <laughs> right. I think I can understand that statement because Moshe was the one that did indeed brought down the Torah because in a sense, he is Mashiach. Yeah. So I think that text is playing on that, like a wordplay, so to speak, you know? Well, I've always thought about that, about how it says in one in Israel uh, rose a greater prophet than Moshe, right? Yeah. Literally in the Torah, right? So the Shem's putting a stamp on it. Uh, but <clears throat> the way I've thought about that is like when it comes to prophecy, like there's really nothing else than Moshe against the prophet side. You know what I mean? Like, oh, that's, that's yeah. how I've always thought about it. So, I mean, it doesn't really bother me. You know what I mean? Like when somebody says, oh, well, Moshe is a greater prophet than the Mashiach. Well, yeah. I mean, there's going to be nothing left to prophesy about. Everything will have to come to its, its full culmination at that point. So I don't know if that makes sense, but that's, that's kind of how I've always thought about that, specifically when it comes to Moshe. Yeah. I mean, in the historical sense of the word, it's, I mean, I got, you know, the Messiah text, you know, Jewish legends of 3,000 years, and I've been reading chapter 13, because that's how far I'm into this thing, and the mother of Messiah, because we all know how Christianity basically holds up Mashiach as totally divine, you know, they say he's God and all that, you know, basically replacing Moshe, because they deride him so much, you know, be, and they and denigrate the Torah, you know, cause facial, um, you know, because he writes here in contrast to Christianity and parts of which the mother of, of the Messiah became a central divine personality whose popular worship frequently tended to overshadow that of her son. In Judaism, the mother of Messiah remained a shadowy and enigmatic human figure to whom little attention was paid. In fact, there's only one Talmudic legend in which she appears. Her name is not stated, but her husband's name is said to be Hezekiah. Uh, evidently so named after the king of Judah, whom the sages consider to have been an early Messiah. Let's see chapter three. Her son's name is Menachem, comforter. This Messiah was born on the very day the Second Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in 70 CE. But sometime later, a storm wind snatched him from his mother's arms and he disappeared. As for the Midrash literature, in it too, only a very few legends speak about the mother of Messiah. In one similar to the Talmudic story, the mother of Messiah remains anonymous. In another, she is called Hephzibah and is the wife of the prophet Nathan. Her son Menachem, the Messiah, is, however, not the son of Nathan, but of a certain Amiel. He was born in the days of King David and ever since has been waiting, hidden in the city of Rome. Before the time comes for Menachem to reveal himself, his mother Hephzibah will slay 
two kings, gather all Israel, and cause confusion in the enemy camp. In another Midrash, she's the widow of Zarephath, and yet in another, Naamah, the Ammonite, wife of King Solomon, is identified as the Messiah's early ancestress. Finally, in the Zohar, there is a myth fragment, according to which the mother of both Messiahs, the son of Joseph and the son of David, is none other than the Shekinah, the personified female aspect of God, who is also identified with the community of Israel. And that's just for starters in this chapter. Um, the anonymous mother, Rav Yodan, son of Rav Abel, said, it happened to be a Judean, a Jew who was standing and leading his ox. His ox lowed before him, an Arab passed by and heard his voice. He said to him, son of Judah, son of Judah, untie your ox, untie your plow, for the temple has been destroyed. The ox lowed a second time, and the Arab said, son of Judah, Judean, tie your ox and tie your plow, for the king Messiah has been born. He asked him, what is his name? Menachem, he asked him. And what is the name of his father, Hezekiah, he asked him. And where is he? He answered, from the royal fort of Bethlehem in Judah. He went and sold his ox and sold his plow and became a seller of infants' clothes and went from town to town until he came to that town and all the women bought clothes from him. But the mother of Menachem did not buy. He heard the talk of the women saying, Mother of Menachem, come buy clothes for your son. She said, I wish that the enemies of Israel, euphemism for my son, should suffocate. For on the day in which he was born in the temple, and what, for on the day in which he was born, the temple was destroyed. He said to her, we are sure that if it was destroyed because of him, it will be rebuilt because of him. Then she said to him, I have not a penny. He said to her, I do not mind. Come and buy for him. For you, if you have no money today, another day I shall return and get it. Days later, he returned to that town and said to her, how is your baby? She said to him, since you have seen me last, winds and storms have come and snatched him away from my hands. And that's from Yerushalmi Barakot 5a. And then until the day that Jerusalem was taken, Jeremiah 38, 28, even that day was not anguish, but rejoicing. For on that day was born Menachem. And on that day, Israel received full payment for all their sins. For Rav Shmuel Bar Nachmani said, on the day on which the temple was destroyed, Israel received great retribution for their sins. For it is written, the punishment of thy iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. Lamentations 4.22. And from where do we know that on the that day was the Messiah born? For it is written, before she travailed, she brought forth. Isaiah 66.7. On the day on which the temple was destroyed, Eliyahu, a blessed memory, was walking along the road. He heard a heavenly voice cry out and say, The holy temple has become a ruin. The children of the king went into captivity. The wife of the king remained a widow. As soon as Eliyahu heard this, he said to himself, it is his will to destroy the world. He went and found people plowing and sowing and said to them, the Holy One, blessed be he, is worth his wrath with his world and wants to destroy his house, to exile his children among the nations of the world, and you occupy yourselves with transitory matters. A heavenly voice was heard and said, let them be for all ready. Their savior has been born. Eliyahu then said to the heavenly voice, where is he? She said, in Bethlehem of Judah. He went and found a woman who was seated at the door of her house. And her son, soiled with blood, was lying in front of her. He said to her, my daughter, did you give birth to a son? She said, yes. He said to her, why is he soiled with blood? She said, a great evil, for on the day on which he was born, the temple was destroyed. He said to her, my daughter, 
rise and take him up, for a great salvation will come to you through him. Instantly she arose and lifted him up, and he gave her clothes to dress him and ornaments to decorate him, but she did not want to accept them. He said to her, Take these from me, and after a time I shall come and get their price. He left her and went away. Five years later, he said, Let me go and see the Savior of Israel, whether he is growing up to look like kings or to look like ministering angels. He went and found the woman standing at the door of her house. He said to her, My daughter, how is that boy? She said to him, Rabbi, I did not tell you that this luck was bad. On the day on which he was born, the temple was destroyed, and although he had feet, he did not walk. He had ears, but did not hear. He had eyes, but did not see. He had a mouth, but did not speak, but was lying there like a stone. Then a wind bore down upon him from the four corners of the world and blew him into the great sea. Eliyahu rent his clothes and tore his hair and cried and said, Woe, lost is the salvation of Israel. A heavenly voice was heard and said, Eliyahu, it is not as you think, but for 400 years he will dwell in the great sea, and 80 years in the smoke ascent of the sons of Korah, and 80 years in the gates of Rome, and the rest of the years he will wander in all the great countries until the end. And then this next part is the interesting one. It gets more mystical on Hefzibah. Get this. Metatron addresses Zerubbabel in Rome. I am he who led Abraham all over the land of Canaan. And I am he who redeemed Yitzhak and who struggled with Yaakov at the ford of Jabok. I am he who led Israel in the desert for 40 years in the name of the Lord. I am he who appeared to Joshua in Gilgal. I am he whose name is like the name of my master, and his name is in me. And you, Zerubbabel, ask me, and I shall tell you what will happen to your people at the end of days. And he said to me, This is the Messiah of the Lord who is hidden here until the time of the end. And his name is Menachem, son of Amiel. And he was born in the days of David, king of Israel. And the Spirit carried him and hid him here until the time of the end. And I asked Metatron, and he said to me, The Holy One, blessed be he, will give the staff of salvation to Hephzibah, the mother of Menachem, and a star shall shine before her. And Hephzibah will go out and slay two kings. One is Naf from Yemen, and the other's name is Asarno of Antioch. And these signs will come to pass on the feast of Shavuot, and the thing is true. And when the city of Jerusalem will be rebuilt after 420 years, it will be destroyed a second time. And when Rome will be rebuilt, 70 kings will rule in it, and the tenth of them will destroy the temple, and daily offerings will cease. And from that day count 999 years, then will be the salvation of the Lord, and he will remember his holy people to redeem them, and to take them, and to carry them, and to gather them. And the staff which the Lord will give to Hephzibah, the mother of Menachem, is of an almond tree, and it is hidden in Rakat, in a city of Naphtali. And it is the staff of Aharon, and Moshe, and David, king of Israel. And it is the staff which flowered in the tent of meeting, and brought forth blossoms, and produced almonds. And Elijah, son of Eleazar, hid, hid it in Rakat, which is in Tiberias. And there was hidden the Messiah, son of Ephraim. And Zerubbabel, son of Sheatil, said to Michael, if it please my Lord, when will come the light of Israel? And what will be after all this? And he said to me, Messiah, son of Joseph, will come five years after Hephzibah and will gather all Israel as one man. And then the king of Persia will come up against Israel and there will be great distress in Israel. And Hephzibah, the wife of the prophet Nathan, will go out with a staff which the Lord will give her. And the Lord will make a spirit of confession, confusion enter them and they will slay one another. And the and there the wicked will die. And when I heard his words, I fell on my face and said to him, tell me the truth about the holy people. And he adhered to me and showed me a stone in the shape of a woman and said to me, this stone, Satan, will lie with it. And from it will come forth Armilus, and he will rule over the entire world. And there will be nobody to stand up against him. 
and all those who do not believe in him will die by this, by his cruel sword. And he will come to the land of Israel with ten kings to Jerusalem, and there, and they will slay the Messiah, son of Joseph, and with him sixteen pious men. And they will exile Israel into the desert. And Hephzibah, the mother of Menachem, will stand there. <clears throat> and that wicked one will not see her. And this war will be in the month of Av. And then there will be trouble in Israel, like of which never was in the world. And they will flee into the crevices and caves in the deserts. And all the nations of the world will go astray after that wicked one, the Satan, army loose, except for Israel. And Israel will mourn over Nehemiah, son of Hushiel, who will be killed. And his corpse will be cast before the gates of Jerusalem, but the wild animals and birds will not touch it. That's pretty intense. <laughs> but then a lot of what the master says in Matthew just popped in my head, one thing after another. Like what he says in Luke, there will come a time not like any other, not since the, not since the beginning. Yeah, what does he say in Luke? It's like twenty-two. Oh well, yeah, Luke 21, 25. There will appear signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and on earth nations will be in anxiety and bewilderment at the sound and surge of the sea. This part of the Messiah text used the sea as a metaphor quite extensively in this in this part. As people faint with fear at the prospect of what is overtaking the world for the powers in heaven will be shaken and then they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with tremendous power and glory. When these things start to happen, stand up and hold your heads high because you are about to be liberated. I mean, a good template for this is the Exodus. Let's see out Mitzrayim. The plagues of Exodus are instructive, but what is missing from that account is a rapture. Because of Hashem's covenant faithfulness, he'll bring Israel and those who attach, or, attach themselves to the God of Israel will be preserved all the way through it. Yeah, Moshe Rabbeinu's prophecy was on the level of Da'at. That's what the Ari says. Uh, Amulus is a, a reference to the uh, anti Messiah. Oh, I know, I know who he is. I just didn't yeah. hear the part about the him being oh. born in rock. That's insane. Yeah, I know. I mean, uh, I remember Ray Luke on Facebook posted about him a while back, and I immediately thought of that. And that one section right there would be perfect comment on that post of his. I meant to say about 
Moshe's prophecy being dot because it talks about like every other prophet could only prophesy through nine screens. So, yeah, um, Tyus, if you wrote, that means he didn't have to go through the other nine. No, yeah, his uh, just trying to remember, um, it requires a certain level of piety to achieve that level, and that's what Moshe had was that indeed i mean i that's you know when people denigrate moshe you're really just shooting yourself in the foot spiritually speaking you know of all you know that's something i me first speaking for myself that's something i've always been careful about and all my time in the church when i hear you know pastors just you know denigrate him and the Torah, you know, I was just like, guys, I, you really should stop, man, because really, that's the Sean Hara. <laughs> you know? Yeah, this whole section is the widow of Zarephath, Nehemiah, Well, yeah, let's over, Shlomo. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you little guy, so cute. <laughs> his, head, his head's falling backwards. <laughs> He's dreaming. This little guy. <laughs> So is he walking yet? Amen. Nice. Pretty soon he's going to be learning his letters. <laughs> well, I can keep on reading this if you guys like. I mean, I'm wide awake. <laughs> I'm going to be up all night, so. <laughs> I mean, this is like. We're used to staying up till four, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wanted to give everybody an opportunity to, to share or ask questions in case anybody had anything that they needed to discuss we have the time to take sources uh like go straight to the source you know and and kind of search it out so that's why uh, it stopped give yeah. people a chance that way I can, uh... <laughs> that's why i'll stay up all night <laughs> Yeah, in the uh, Tikkun Leil Shavu book, they actually have all of the books of Torah that you can actually go through. So 
this would be the ancient practice of staying up all night as you would go through the whole entire Tanakh, what's commonly called the Old Testament, and having the discussions back and forth of like, you know, different things that are in the accounts of the prophets or the the crazy stories that are in first and second kings you know like all of those different things so um that book is super packed rabbi pavanov did such an amazing job of just putting all the material together <clears throat> in one place so that everyone can have like a one-stop shop so uh this one of the oh, yeah. reasons why it's a popular resource to use uh, especially for shabbat because as you can see with if you took the time to stop and discuss it would actually uh it would take quite a bit of time in previous years when we did the just the five books of torah it took us uh, about three or four hours just to finish bear sheet you know because we were just taking each torah portion and breaking it down and so uh, one of the things that was helpful for tonight hopefully was the fact of kind of collapsing it all down and giving us some uh, unstructured time in the middle to kind of rest and get our minds reset. So, yeah. why did they call Jesus Yeshua when the angel said to call him Emmanuel? So that's a, that's a good one. Um, the first thing to mention is the prophecy about calling him Emmanuel actually goes back to um, Hezekiah because he actually should have been given that name. And this is why even Hillel the sage said that if uh, Hezekiah is not the Messiah, then there will not be one, which obviously there was clarity brought to that because we know Hezekiah wasn't the Messiah. And there are other stipulations, like when he was delivered from the big battles that he uh, was victorious over, Hashem gave him these miraculous defeats, and he never, ever uh, gave a song of praise. You know, like in the wilderness, when we triumphed over the Ammonites and other people who tried to take us out while we we're in the wilderness, we sang a song to Hashem. You know, the song at the sea is a really big one. So the Messiah is supposed to do that as well, which is another reason why when we talk about Yeshua, like his mission isn't complete yet. So we haven't heard that final song. There's this said that there's going to be 10 songs that are primordial songs, and we know nine of them and the Messiah is going to bring the 10th one. So, you know, th that's to come. But anyway, when you look at the attachment of Manuel, it's more of a title than a literal name because the whole understanding of the Mashiach is that through him we have the reconnection to Hashem just like we talk about that there's the Zadik who attaches us to Hashem the Shekinah the Torah Israel you know and all these things so when we talk about Emmanuel we're talking about that concept of you know like Hashem is with us kind of thing and if you look at the fact of why do we have the tabernacle in the wilderness, it was to house the tablets. And Hashem said, my presence cannot be separated from the Torah. So this is why we needed to build a space for Hashem so that he can be with us. So when you really look at Emmanuel, it's actually about the tabernacle. It's actually about the temple. It's actually about the Torah. So... There's a lot more that could be said on it. I'm pretty sure the uh, commentary in Isaiah would actually talk about that. Let me see if I can track that down. So I know I have that open over here. So if you go to Isaiah, should be chapter nine. No, it's not. Okay. What chapter is that?
Oh, it's chapter seven. Okay. Yeah, seven fourteen. Breaking that word down grammatically, though. Imanu with us, and then L refers to the all powerful one, which is the root for Elohim. Do you have the art scroll commentary? Um, not on the prophets, no. That's been on my list for quite a while. Oh, we got a few in English over here. Oh, Sorry, yeah. Okay, here's some Rashi. That is to say, our rock shall be with us. And this is the sign, for she is a young girl, and she never prophesied. Yet in this instance, Ruach HaKodesh, divine inspiration, shall rest upon her. This is what is stated below in Isaiah 8, verse 3. And I was, in, and I was intimate with the prophetess. And we do find, or we do not find, a prophet's wife called a prophetess unless she prophesied. Some interpret this as being said about Hezekiah, but it is impossible because when you count his years, you find that Hezekiah was born nine years before his father's reign. And some interpret this sign that she was a young girl and incapable of giving birth. So I just wanna point out that the whole thing about Emmanuel is supposed to be about a young woman who is incapable of giving birth, which is a whole nother aspect to the term virgin or young maiden. And then, um, the whole fact that she's going to be like prophesying, which is funny because who is Miriam's cousin? Elizabeth, who is married to Zachariah, not the Zachariah of the Tanakh, but a different Zachariah who is a priest. And when he was given the message about his son, John, Yochanan, the Immerser, you know, like that's Yeshua's cousin. So this whole thing about uh, the way prophecy was connected into the family and how Yochanan was a prophet, but he was also a priest. And it's like Miriam was given this mantle of prophecy. And, you know, she had the angel appear to her, the angel appeared to Yosef, to say, hey, your wife is correct, you know, this kind of thing, you know, so it's actually a beautiful tapestry of things, but just based off of the Rashi, you see this whole uh, aspect of a young woman who it says is incapable of giving birth. I wouldn't necessarily say that Miriam may have been, you know, barren, but it would totally fit the, the template because we read about Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, you know, all of them had trouble conceiving. So I was thinking of that myself, um, where Sarai, after the birth of Ishmael, tells Abraham, I don't want this son to be heir with my son, you know, cast him out. And it grieved Abraham. He didn't want to do it at first. <laughs> but Hashem told him, I'll do what your wife tells you to do. But what we have as a kind of a dichotomy is when Gabriel comes to Zechariah when he's in the middle of his temple service and he tells him about the birth of Yochanan the Immerser, he didn't believe it at first because his wife was old just like Sarai was. And for that, Gabriel says, you won't be allowed to speak until the birth. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he, he was, but at his circumcision, that's when he spoke out his name. Yeah, talk about good timing, right? Yeah. <laughs> I always thought that was an interesting uh, parallel, kind of a Mita Kadega Mita thing there.
Tibetan that Messiah text would speak on the Emmanuel part. Let's see here. Talks about Mashiach ben Yosef. Um, that's a trick to know. Let's see. So biblical preamble, pre existence, and names of Messiah, early Messiahs, the ancestry of the Messiah. The waiting, counting of days, hastening the end, son of the clouds, the bird's nest. There's a lot of mystical application there. Right. Where Yeshua says the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. It actually doesn't speak on Emmanuel. That's funny. Yeah, it's nowhere. There's a Maimonides on the Messiah. Yeah, I'm going to go grab my commentary on Isaiah. Yeah, by all means. How's everyone else doing? Doing good. Just waiting with a question. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was offline for a bit. Well, you understand about Emmanuel, the grammar, the breakdown of the word? No. Um, Imanu, uh, with us. Because the, 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 basically the root of that word, im, I think it's I mem Sophie, which is with, and then nu, us. So it's not to be taken literally. Because, for example, God was, was with Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. He was with Moshe. He was with um, Joshua when he took Israel into the land. And so forth. You know, it just goes on from there, and it's and it's enough. Thanks. I saw there was a question in the chat. Lori asked a couple of questions in chat. Yeah, I'm looking at them. Um, a good template for that one would be Exodus 25, verse 8, and Parashat Taruma. Um, the word in that verse in Hebrew, Betokam, in them, and I may dwell in them, Shakan, Betokam. Shaul uses language like that uh, in Corinthians. You know, don't you know that your body or goof in Hebrew is 
the temple of the living God, you know, whose spirit resides within you, you know, the Shekinah. So I don't, so for Lori, who asked that question, I, I hope that answers her question to a certain degree. Oh, really, to, but to answer her question, that would be a yes then, because we, you said we see that in, in Exodus 25, 8, right? Yeah. Good. It's important to be able to read it in Hebrew because it really does come through, come across a lot better. Um, what was it? Um, I had to get out my Tanakh. No matter who much for that one. Are you guys looking something up right now or can I ask a question? Oh, go for it. Okay. Um, I heard something about um, the, is it the tefillin? And, tefillin? And the and the connection between 6666 and the spirit of the law? In the law? Oh. <laughs> I just jarred my memory on a verse in Revelation. Yeah. Um, and they had the, the mark of God in their foreheads. Right. That could only, I mean, my opinion, that can only refer to one thing, and that would be to fill in. Can you explain it? Because we're there. the forehead, the shell roche, the box that's on the forehead, and it goes right about here on the top of your forehead. That's that's an identifying mark. Uh, based on the verse in Habakkuk uh, 2.20. Actually, it's Hosea 2.21. Uh, Ve eris dikli leolam, and I will betroth you to me forever. Um, got my Tanaka out. I'll read it. But isn't isn't there something about the, um, the shin representing six? Um, like the three-pronged shin and then a fourth-pronged shin? Actually, on a tefillin, on the shell roche and the shell yad, there are four branches on the shin. So if you told that up, it's eight, it's shmini, which refers to the world to come or alludes to it. Um, I'm just going to this first um, because Over there, Hosea. Yes. Hmm. 
Yeah, 221. And in the Hebrew, it reads, Ve Aristikli, Le Olam, Ve Aristikli, Ve Zedek, Umishpat, Uva Hesed, Uva Rachamim, Ve Aristikli, Ve Emuna, Vayadaat, Et Adonai. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in right, with righteousness, with justice, with kindness, and with mercy. And I will betroth you to me with fidelity, and you will know Hashem. Fidelity meaning a singular loyalty to Israel, a, a faithfulness. You know, when you see, you know, Be'emunah in faithfulness, meaning he's going to be Covenant faithful to Israel, despite what Israel does, because that's so important. You know, this is this is just another verse that kind of puts the nail in the coffin on replacement theology and supersessionism. Um, another that would add on top of this would be the seven half Torah readings from Isaiah that are read from. Um, after the ninth of Av, up right up to Rosh Hashanah. All seven of those have Torah readings speak of, his, of Hashem's covenant faithfulness that he would never abandon Israel. So that's another aspect of tefillin. When you don tefillin, and they're only worn for morning prayers and not on Shabbat. But yeah, I, I thought of that verse in Revelation when I thought of that, that this is an identifying marker. You know, it identifies God's people, you know, just like Shabbat does, you know, lighting candles, um, Yom Tov, like we're doing right now, studying Torah. It's all identification with Hashem. I put a link in the, bar, in the uh, chat um, about an article that Halissa Allwine wrote about, it's called What's in That Box, that explains it. I, I was, I couldn't find it and then I did, I was able to, so I, I linked it there, but I just wanted to hear you guys explain it too. I thought that'd be interesting, but she does a good job of explaining it. I'm sorry, isn't it the Shema? Well, that too. That's in the box. Yeah, it's like a mezuzah for your forehead and for your your left arm, which is your weak arm. And note that it's wrapped seven times around your arm. Similar to uh, the bride circling the, uh, the bridegroom seven times around the hoopah. I'll check out that link. Oh, yeah, and that's the first time a 13 year old dance to fill in, too. His father shows him how to do it. Yeah, yeah, Uba has said, you know, grace is nothing new. I mean, it's, um, I mean, I've talked about this before. The first time, the question I would ask anyone who thinks that grace is something new, I would immediately ask them, when does that word first show up in scripture then? 
And actually, Emmett quoted it earlier tonight. Um, and I could, that's a verse I can quote in Hebrew, which is Ve Noach Matzehen, Ve Ene Adonai. And Noah found grace in the eyes of Hashem. That is the first time the word Hain shows up in, in scripture. And it's in the very first Parsha at that. Yep. And that reminds me too that the Shema is a rectification for part of Adam Howard's shown sin because um, there's a Hebrew word related to when Adam and Hava were cast out and Hashem tells Adam that by the sweat of your brow you will work the work the soil at Amon. And there's a Hebrew word of a car. But when we come to the Shema, the race is replaced with a Dalet, Echad, one unity, which is the rectification for a car. So every time we recite Shema, we're rectifying the sin of Adam Harishon by declaring our unswerving allegiance, our unswerving loyalty to Hashem and the willingness to obey Him. <coughs> because you find in Devarim 13 that Hashem your God is testing you to know whether or not that you love Hashem your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all that you have. So basically, throughout Devarim, we see the theme of the Shema repeated many times throughout the successive parashiot from Bayat Kanan. Oh, yeah, this is not the, yeah, that's really good. What Rashi says on uh, 11 19. If I could take that back to uh, Bay Rashid, um, Ershav Vaera, the Akeda, because the sages say that Yitzhak was basically dead when Abraham was about to take the knife and Zevak to, to slaughter him. But what's interesting about that is, is that Hashem doesn't tell him to slaughter him. You don't see the Hebrew word sabak anywhere in association with the Akedah, but rather he says, Korban, offer him on one of the mountains that I will show you. So it can be implied from those verses that Hashem had every intention of preventing Abraham from actually offering up Isaac. But even though he laid on the altar, his the, the sages also say that his soul departed him for a time. 
of that it was returned to him. So in a sense, it's uh, resurrection of the dead. So I wonder if Ramban and Orkhaim comments on that verse, which you know, one way to find it. Get out the Orkhaim. Yeah. So just to kind of uh, bring some more to the table on Emmanuel, that this is uh, a sign. So the, the name and the title is about Hashem's presence accompanying the nation. And it has something to do with the natural uh, process of how things are gonna happen, which I think is interesting because the Mashiach is supernatural, but he's born in a natural body. so. To think about uh, the level of Emmanuel and what that would mean, you know, I put that the Luke passage from chapter two uh, is so important because um, this is the prophecy of Simon. And he says this, he says, uh, See Luke two. Where is it? There, two twenty-five. There was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon, who was a Zadik and a Hasid. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Ruach Hakodesh was upon him. The Ruach Hakodesh had revealed to him that he would not see death before he had seen the. Hashem's Mashiach. Led by the Ruach, he went into the temple courts, and when the parents brought in the child, Yeshua, to do for him what was customary under the Torah, Simeon took him in his arms and blessed God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in Shalom, for my eyes have seen your Yeshua which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Goyim and for glory to your people, Israel. And it says that the child's father and mother were amazed at what was spoken about him. And if you look at um, what prophets are supposed to do, 
This is in chapter eight of the handbook. It says, we're commanded to heed the words of a true prophet. It is thus written, God, your Lord will raise up a prophet from among your people. You shall heed him. And although it is possible that a prophet's prediction may be a lucky guess, we're still commanded to accept him as a prophet. And if an established prophet testifies that another is a true prophet, the latter is accepted without any further test. Moshe thus testified regarding Yeshua or Yehoshua, and Yehoshua was accepted by all of Israel as a prophet before providing any sign or miracle. So in other words, when Simeon, who was operating under prophecy, was speaking this over Yeshua, he was not only uh, validating you know, this is the Mashiach, because remember what we read earlier, how there's got to be a prophet to anoint the Mashiach. This is why Eliyahu is so important. Well, even at Yeshua's birth, like the whole testimony about him being called Emmanuel, being called the consolation of Israel, the salvation prepared, the light to the nations, like he was being testified about and validated in so many different ways. And just the name itself, Emmanuel, is a testimony to his status as Mashiach, because in order for us to have Mashiach, he's the, the revelation of God's presence with us, bringing us the, the victories that we need, bringing us the salvation. Because literally, when you look at the word for salvation, it literally means God's divine assistance. So in the chat, I posted uh, the Rosh bomb who talks about Eliezer and also talks about Emmanuel, these names imply Hashem's help, Hashem's aid, Hashem's assistance. So with Yeshua, we have the fact that he's called Emmanuel, the fact that he's God is with us, the fact that he is God's divine assistance. Not only did Yochanan testify about him, but Simeon as well. And all these different uh, passages are basically just circling around the fact of you know, understanding, you know, this is the Mashiach. So the more we know about all of that uh, would be important as far as what his name is. So those are a couple of things. And then the Ramban, you know, bringing all this down as well about the natural uh, sign and the wonder that's going on. And then for the mark, on the forehead, whether it's a tav or whether it's a shin. That's actually in, um, I believe, Ezekiel. Yeah, it's pretty much speculation on my part. Um, uh, Ezekiel 9.1. So if we go there, oh. it says that uh, bring near those appointed over the city. So go throughout the city of Jerusalem, put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over the detestable things that are done in it. There we go. So Ezekiel 9, 4. The commentary says, these men are people who remain righteous despite the sinfulness of the city. The sign on their foreheads will protect them from the destructive forces about to hit Jerusalem. In the vision, Ezekiel was to write the letter Tav in ink on their foreheads. So. When you look at the tefillin, it's the letter Shin that's on their forehead. 
And I'm trying to think of how the Tav would fit in there. Well, Ramban has something interesting on uh, Devarim 11.18. Okay. Uh, Usham Tem et Devarim uh, Ilay. We shall place these words in mind. Ramban discusses the Midrashic exposition cited by Rashi on the connection between the command, you shall place these words of mine, and the threat of exile that precedes it. Even after you go into exile, be distinguished through the performance of commandments. Lay to fill in, make a mezuzah, so that the commandments will not be new to you when you return to the land. In footnote 50, according to this interpretation, the Torah means you will be banished from the land, and even there, in your place of exile, you shall place, and you shall bind, and you shall teach, and you shall write. And similarly, it says, make road markers for yourself, Jeremiah 31, 20. Footnote 51, this verse was spoken by Jeremiah to Israel concerning their Exile, uh, Ziyunim, markers are the commandments. When you go into exile, Jeremiah exhorted the people, mark your route, so to speak, by fulfilling the commandments so that when the exile is over and you return to the land, the commandments will not be new to you. The above quote from Rashi, from Sifre here, 43, Ramban elaborates the Sifre quoted by Rashi. And I've already written that the explanation of this matter, which on the surface is difficult, since these commandments of Tefillin and Mezuzah are personal obligations, i.e. they have nothing to do with the land or its produce, and thus should apply in all places just as within the land. Why then does the Sifre say that they apply outside the land only so that they will not be new to us when we return but there are but there lies within this midrash a profound secret and i've already alluded to it rabban presents a further portion of sifre's exposition but paraphrases it instead of citing it verbatim this next portion of sifre accounts for the repetition here of various commandments that were previously commanded in almost identical terms in the passage uh, Ve Ahafta, C six seven and nine above Devarim. Now, according to this Sifre scripture, reiterated here these commandments to fill in studying the words of Torah and Mezuzah a second time in order to allude by means of this juxtaposition that we would be obligated in these commandments even after the exile to the outside the land, and from them i.e. from the example of these commandments stated here in the verse, the scripture intended that we learn in regard to all commandments that are similarly personal obligations that they too apply in all places and that we would be exempt outside the land from any commandment that are land obligations such as separating to Ruma and ties. This is how the verse is expounded in Sifre here, number 44. Then Ramban elaborates on it. An intention of the Midrash, i.e. basis for Sifre's interpretation is because scripture placed the phrase, you shall place, etc., next to the phrase, you will be banished, thereby indicating that you will place, that you shall place is to take place after you are exiled to other lands. And then he comments on the exposition but this is only a midrashic exposition of the verse, not as plain meaning because the primary intent of the verse is to bid us to observe the commandments within the land for it is written in order to prolong your days and the days of your children upon the land. Alternatively, it may be that Sifre's exposition indeed comports with in verses plain meaning and when scripture says in order to prolong your days upon the land see i see that phrase quite a, quite a bit here 
upon the land, meaning you're in the land, you are doing these mitzvot in the land. It means that if you observe the commandments in exile, you will merit to return to the land and live on it long days forever. See how much more. That's not much more. So, having explained according to Sifrei, the Torah's ex repetition here of the commandments stated in the passage of a Ahavta, Ramban offers some additional reasons for the repetition. And it is plausible, according to the plain manner of interpretation, that scripture came to add here the words to discuss them, which do not appear in the passage in Avea Hafta. Because there, scripture commanded, you shall relate them to your children, and you yourself shall speak of them while you sit in your home, etc. Whereas here it says that we should teach them to our children until they, the children, speak of them at all times. Likewise, scripture added here, you shall teach them to your children, because the verse in the passage of Vea Hafta, you shall relate them to your children, above 6 7, implies merely that you shall tell them the commandments. Whereas here, the obligation of educating one's children is extended to the point that the children learn the commandments and know and understand them and their reasons to speak of them with you at all times. Likewise, scripture added here, like the days of the heavens, heaven over the earth, which means for all future generations. Rabban now presents a Kabbalistic explanation of the phrase, Kime uh, Hashemayim, Al Ha'aretz, which is beyond the purview of our elucidation. And that's that for that. Then on verse 22. See, two of the entire commandment that I command you to perform it to love Hashem your God, to walk in all his ways and to cleave to him. Just curious about C22. Ki im shamor. Which hand is You put it on your less dominant hand, your weaker hand. So if oh, you're yeah. in it, you put it on your left. Yeah, typically so it's the left. Right. So here's the other thing, too, about the mark. So with looking at the Ezekiel passage, it references Tractate Shabbat 55a. And it also uh, makes me think about uh, Exodus, where we had to paint blood on our doorposts. So when you put all these together, there's a distinguishing mark that is used because the blood on the doorpost also looked like the letter Tav. So the marking on the forehead has to do with a sign for the destructive forces. The same sign can be placed on the head of a righteous person and the same sign can be placed on the head of a wicked person. The distinguishing comes through what are the actions that are being taken, which if you think about how powerful this is, Wicked people can put on to fill him just as well as the righteous can. You know, I also think about, I think it's a proverb that says it rains on the righteous and the wicked, you know? And so here's how the Talmud phrases it. It says the Holy one blessed is he said to the angel Gabriel, go and mark a tav of ink on the foreheads of the righteous so that the angels of destruction that I wish to send up on the city shall have no power over them. And on the foreheads of the wicked, set a tav of blood, so that the angels of destruction shall have power over them. Again, the same letter is placed on the wicked and the righteous. One is going to be protection. The other one is going to give the destructive forces power to destroy them. And it says, said the attribute of strict justice before the Holy One, blessed is he. Master of the universe, what's the difference between these and these? God replied, these are completely righteous and these are completely wicked. 
strict justice then said before God, master of the universe, the righteous had the opportunity to protest against the abominations, but they did not. God said to strict justice in reply, it is revealed and known to me that if they protested against the sinners, the sinners would not have accepted any reproof from them. You know, there's this whole thing where if you're going to try to give a, a reproof to someone, like try to correct them, if you know the person won't listen to you, you're actually called to not speak out because otherwise you're supposed to, if there's a chance that someone might listen. So in this case, we're learning uh, about the reason why these righteous people didn't speak out against the sinners in Israel is because no one was going to listen. So strict justice then said before God, if it is revealed before you, it is revealed to the righteous. Or is it revealed to the righteous? And then the Isaiah passage says, according to the sages, the Tav was literally um the it's the last letter of the hebrew olive bet when the letter tav is used as a prefix of a verb it means you shall and then it says the letter tav written in ink on the foreheads of the righteous would symbolize uh tikie which means you shall live which is the root of uh tikiat which is uh to resurrect so in addition, the letter Tav was written in blood on the heads of the wicked to symbolize Tamut, which is you shall die. So righteous people are connected to life. Wicked people are connected to death. So when you added the Tav to the head of a righteous person, you literally added a Tav to what they do, which is they shall live. You put the Tav to the letter for life in Hebrew on the head of a righteous person. The wicked person is connected to death. So when you added a tav to their forehead, you connected a tav to the Hebrew word for death, which sealed both of their fates. So just as the person who was operating in life was sealed with a tav, so the person who operates in death was sealed with a tav. So that's another aspect of what's going on here. So again, when you think about the tefillin, you think about the tav, these are both called signs. And the signs can either save you from destruction or seal you for destruction, which is why when you go back to the Egypt uh, part that I was thinking about, this all made me think about the blood on the doorpost. If you read about the Midrash on what happened in the homes of Egyptians, because they got the memo that they needed blood on the doorpost. But there were Egyptians who painted blood on their doorposts, but they did not trust in Hashem. They did not want to be in covenant with Hashem. So they were like, oh, yeah, just put the sign up. Like, it's an omen, you know, get the, get the destructive forces away. But it says that the angel, of, the angel of death actually visited the homes of the Egyptians who had blood on their doorposts. So in all reality, the blood on the doorpost was not the main thing. The main thing was where is your heart attached and connected to? So again, just a whole nother level and dynamic of, you know, you can't just use the sign, you know, you can't just wear tzitzit or wear tefillin and be like, see, I'm holy, I'm righteous. You can't just put a mezuzah on your door and be like, yeah, so I'm good. So hopefully that helps. Really good. Thanks, Hamet. Welcome, Sean. Okay, so the other actually uh, that reminds me of uh, Yehezkel sixteen in regards to Jerusalem. <clears throat> um, the word of Hashem came to me saying, "Son of man, inform Jerusalem of her abomination." Saying, "Thus said the Lord Hashem Elohim." To Jerusalem, your dwelling place and your birthplace are of the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your birth, on the day you were born, your umbilical cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to smooth your skin, nor were you salted, nor were you swaddled. No, I pitied you to do any of these things for you, to show you compassion 
you were cast out upon the open field because of the loathing, loathsomeness of your being on the day you were born. Then I passed you and saw you wallowing in your blood and said to you, in your blood, you shall live. I said to you, in your blood, you shall live. I made you as numerous as the plants of the field. You increased and grew and you came to have great charm. Breast developed and your hair sprouting, but you were naked and bare. I passed by you and saw you and behold, your time was the time of love. And I spread the hems of my garment over you and covered your nakedness and took an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you. The word of, of, of the Lord Hashem Elohim and you became mine. I bathed you with water and washed away your blood from upon you. And I anointed you with oil. I clothed you in embroidered garments. I shod you in takash leather. I bound you with linen. I covered you with silk. I decked you with ornaments. I put bracelets on your hands and a necklace on your neck. And I placed a ring on your nose, earrings on your ears, and a crown of beauty on your head. You decked yourself with gold and silver. Your garments were linen, silk, and embroidery. You ate fine flour, honey, and oil. You became exceedingly beautiful, and you became fit for royalty. Your fame went forth among the nations for your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendor, which I placed upon you, the word of the Lord Hashem, Elohim. So there's a lot of imagery there. You know, of the benefits of being in the covenant, you know, following after Hashem, you know, attaching yourself to him. Uh, the, this is like, there's another beautiful connection to this in Psalm. You know, I have chosen Zion. I have desired it for my dwelling place. Okay, so this is from Handbook of Jewish Thought, Volume 2, Chapter 25. The final Messiah will be a normal human being born of human parents. It is thus possible that he is already born. Footnote, even if we interpret the passage, behold a young woman who is called Alma in Hebrew shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 7 14 to refer to the Messiah the correct translation of Alma is young woman and not virgin see Radak Mezudo David the proper Hebrew word for virgin is Betula and Alma is never translated as virgin thus there is no Jewish tradition that the Messiah will be born born of a virgin It says, similarly, the Messiah will be mortal. He will eventually die and bequeath his kingdom to his son or his successor. Note, it says, or his successor, because when the Mashiach bin Yosef passes, it goes to Mashiach bin David, which we know is the same person, but yeah. So the whole thing too about Emmanuel it doesn't literally mean like his name has to be Emmanuel. It's just the connotations of what Isaiah was talking about in chapter seven and chapter eight, you know, about the one, the young woman who was going to give birth to the son. Um, that's really more about what Emmanuel is about. So just to add to what we were talking about earlier. I mean, it could just very well mean that like God was with Elizabeth 
So was he with Miriam? Oh yeah. Um, or uh, uh, Hannah and Samuel, she prayed for her son because her womb was closed. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's basically a recurring theme throughout the, the Tanakh. Well, I mean, it started with the birth of the Jewish nation. Yeah. Had it not been for Hashem being with us, there wouldn't have ever been any Jews because Sarah was barren. Yeah. I mean, what I read here from Ezekiel uh, 16, you know, where it says your dwelling place and your birthplace are of the land of Canaan. You know, that's, that's an inference or a remez for uh, Lech Lecha. Um, I mean, there was a point where Abraham had to stay and, and was never told to leave uh, Canaan, on which, you know, Eretz Israel, but the famine caused him to be afraid, so he headed down to Mitzrayim. And there he ran into trouble because, you know, Pharaoh looked on uh, Sarai, his wife, you know, because I have told him, you know, just tell him you're my sister, not my wife. You know, and then Pharaoh had those, then he had those dreams, you know, the Hashem was warning him to send him back to, send her back to Avram. Otherwise things are going to get a whole lot worse for you. So I want to bring some more on Isaiah 7. This is from uh, what the rabbis know about the Messiah. Okay. And so this says God rejected King Ahaz because he was unworthy of God's miracles. So another aspect of Emmanuel is that Hashem's, Hashem's sign is miraculous things happening. This is another reason why when you look at the life of Yeshua, his life is a testimony of him being called Emmanuel because of all the miracles. And again, it's not only about miracles. Even Moshe Rabbeinu was able to do miracles, but that that accompanied everything about, you know, who he is and what he did. So it says this. God promises a sign of a supernatural child born of a virgin. And it says who would carry the symbolic name. So, again, it's symbolic. This is on page 51, by the way. And it says, he would be the promised king who would not make alliances with Assyria. The mighty Assyrians would not prevail because Emmanuel and not Ahaz would rule Israel. The other part about Emmanuel is that this is a testimony to his faithfulness in, to Hashem because many of the kings one of the failures of the kings was that they made alliances with nations that surrounded them. And we're not supposed to do that. So if you think about what was going on when Yeshua was here the first time, that there was this whole uh, connection to Rome. 
the reason why Rome was even a thing is because we asked Rome to come in and help with our infighting. Rome was like, sure, we'll help you out. And then they set up camp and took over. <laughs> so when Yeshua showed up, it was like, oh no, like this is going to be treason for us. We're going to defy Rome because we're not going to, uh, he's going to make too much of a, uh, he's going to ruffle feathers basically, because if Israel begins to break away and become sovereign apart from Rome, that's a threat to Caesar because Rome is trying to take over and, and dominate, you know, and they ran and controlled all of the divisions of the land, Israel included. This is why when you look at uh, Pilate and Herod and all of that, these are aspects of the rulership of Rome and Israel under the Mashiach ben David is a sovereign nation. This is one of the big key differences that we'll know about being in a state of exile versus being in a state of redemption is that Israel will be a sovereignty. No one will have authority or, or, and dominion over us, which if you look at what's going on in the land right now, it's a lot of chaos in Israel as far as who's leading it and also who has control over particular parts of the land. As we move into the, the completion of the final redemption, no one's going to have the hearsay or the what to do and what not to do over Israel other than the king of Israel. We're going to be a sovereign nation. And so the whole thing about Emmanuel is that when we have our established king like we're supposed to, we're not going to be looking to other nations to to help with the politics or the government control or the logistics of how to run the nation and govern the people. And this was one of the uh, rectifications that has to be made, you know, for the kings, because when, when the kingdom split between the northern and the southern, Israel and Judah, you know, the, the northern kingdom, they spun off into idolatry. And then the Southern Kingdom, you know, we went back and forth between kings who were uh, pulling us closer to Hashem versus kings who were just like, ah, just be idolaters, do whatever you want. So when the Mashiach comes, he's going to be the one that really brings Israel into a state of sovereignty. Keep Israel purely devoted to Hashem, not making treaties and alliances with other nations, other people groups and things like that, because Israel is supposed to stand on their own. We're not supposed to be relying on other kingdoms and other uh, government leaders and powers to help us do what we're doing. So that's another big point of why the Mashiach is called Emmanuel. Yeah. <laughs> Gonna be the king that keeps us pure with Hashem. Yeah, the other side of that coin would be the Arab Rav because um, I, mean, I mean, what we see now, you know, because Israel is behaving like the countries that we're living in, you know, when we look mm -hmm. at the state of our country right now, it's just absolutely crazy what's going on, but <clears throat> it's really of no surprise. But usually, um, there's also the rectification for the Arab Rav as well, because I've been reading that book as well, um, Unlocking the Secret of the Arab Rav, um, is that even they need to be brought back into the fold, because a lot of them, there are Jews who are off the derrick, as well as you got, you got Palestinians in, sitting on the Knesset in Israel that are causing problems. Um, which is why Hashem's warning when you go into the land, you're going to expel them. Don't even bother pitying them. Don't shed a tear because it's idolatry that you're getting rid of. You know, again, it, it's like it always comes back to the Elenu prayer all the time. You know, mm -hmm. it's like it's almost like a circular statement, you know, because um, the minute Israel starts behaving like the nations around them is the minute they start getting into trouble because sin becomes an entanglement. 
And after a while, it almost becomes impossible just to clean house. Because, you know, like, look what happened with Trump during his presidency. They just went after him when he tried to clean things up in, in our country, you know. <laughs> they just made up all kinds of stuff. I mean, just, you know, behaving very badly, you know. Um, but, yeah, um, but Hashem, he was so merciful that even when... Uh, Rehoboam split from Israel to the northern kingdom. Hashem, would, it took him a thousand years to finally execute judgment and bring uh, Syria in. And Syria was in a very cruel country to Israel. Almost, almost as bad as Amalek, which is uh, Israel's arch enemy. You know, and then, you know, Judah finally got taken into Babylon by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. But then the thing there is that Nebuchadnezzar exceeded his mandate that Hashem gave him. And then he went insane because of it. Um, you know, it's, that's the thing, you know, Hashem uses the nations to, to deal with Israel. But when the nations exceed what Hashem has said that they should do in, in prophecy, then you know, destruction comes upon them. You know, just poop, that's it, you know. Yeah, the other thing I find interesting in events in Israel is uh, the Temple Mount, where numerous on numerous occasions where you've seen Palestinians, you know, militant uh, Islamists, just throwing rocks and stuff at the Al Aqsa Mosque, and you guys are saying, you know, you don't want the Jews up here to pray. Mm. You know, you want them stuck at the Western Wall. And here you are playing soccer. You're throwing rocks at the Al-Aqsa. You're, you're vandalizing your own mosque. Why have it here to begin with? You know, if you don't appreciate it, you know. You know, what I mean, what I'm starting to see is this, this collapse, this implosion of evil. Because it is it's going to implode in on itself. I think, I, you know... That's what I've been seeing lately, you know, and we don't really need to do anything. Our noses should be buried in the Torah, you know, like what we're doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these events are going to play out, you know. It's just that we've not got to make sure that, you know, we're on the derrick, you know, just like Yeshua said, you know. For many will come in my name saying, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these wonderful things? Did we not raise, you know, heal the sick, cast out demons and all this stuff? And he's going to turn around and say, I never knew you. Go for me, you who are Torahlessness, you know, don't obey. I mean, I think the church is going to be in for a serious wake up call, you know. Unless but, they wake up now. But then again, I, you know, actually it is happening. I mean, me and my wife, you, everyone who's here right now, and, you know, I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg, you know, because he's, you know, this is the work of Hashem. He's the one that's bringing this remnant together from the nations, you know, those who are sincere in their desire to embrace the Torah as the mark of their discipleship to the master. That's how you're going to know. You know, making ourselves part of the community, the redeemed community that we've been brought into. 
Um, I mean, all this time we're counting the Omer, and now with Parashat Naso comes Rumination 33. The presence of light reveals flaws. The revelation of the Holy One, blessed is he, reveals our unworthiness to receive that revelation. But that's not the purpose for light, nor for the revelation of Hashem. There's a light of thinking in some theology, sadly, even among some who call themselves Messianic, that goes something like this. The purpose for the law of Moshe, quote, unquote, was to reveal sin and our need for a savior. Now that Jesus has come, the way of salvation is made clear, so we no longer need the law of Moses, quote, unquote. Instead, we have a new law already on shaky ground, the law of Christ. <laughs> While some scripture passages certainly indicate the law reveals sin, there is something missing from this theological misdirection. The effect of the revelation of Hashem always reveals man's frailty and sin. Remember what Shaul says in Romans? If it wasn't for the Torah, I would not know what sin is. Hmm. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw Hashem sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Hashem of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the post of the door was shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, Hashem of hosts. What was the purpose of Isaiah's vision? Simply so he would know that he was a sinner. So this is what you get in Christianity. You get this, you know. How absurd and man-centered. It was a revelation of the Holy One of Israel. Blessed is he. The Torah is the revelation of the righteousness of Hashem. It reveals who he is. And it reveals his Messiah. Just as the flaws of a work are revealed in daylight, so are our weaknesses, our failings, our sins are revealed in his presence. And why would these sins be revealed so we can do something about it? That's why. You know, when you get up in the morning, you know, what's one of the things you do? You know, you realize, oh, I got bad breath, man. I better go brush my teeth, you know. Get out the mouthwash. <laughs> you know, get that going, you know. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a rusty metaphor there, but... <laughs> um, but the thing is, is we've been exposed to this revelation. So now what am I going to do about it? That's what it comes down to. What am I going to do? And just as a candle is subsumed in the brilliance of the midday sun, so is our meager obedience to his righteous standard is as filthy rags. But let us not be confused. The purpose of Torah is not to reveal sin. May it never be said. The purpose of the Torah is to reveal Hashem. It is to reveal Messiah. Oh, yes. And this, we quoted this verse earlier. For if you believed Moshe, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. For Messiah is the goal of the Torah in righteousness to everyone who believes for Moshe writes about the righteousness of the Torah. The man who does these things shall live by them. And essentially, Shaul is quoting Habakkuk 2, verse 4. And the Zadik will live by his faithfulness. 
and the Sages in Makokit, uh, um, 24, distilled all the mitzvot down to that one. <clears throat> Shalom, Kareem. Good to see all of you guys. Hey, JJ. <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice. I, I was, you know, I had the book of uh, Rabbi Ephraim Palvano. It helped me to read. Emma, you had the same one, right? The Likuti Shavuot. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Shlomo. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I love these ruminations, but I think <clears throat> one of my favorites is uh, we got to go back to Yitro for this one. Um, Emmett, I liked what you shared on the Kul Hetora. What is it called? Kulha. You share oh, something yeah. on Who? Or? <clears throat> yeah, to that about. I remember when I first read this one, it just blew me away. <clears throat> In many ways, it still does. Rumination 17. What? Okay, exactly what are. The ten words are what some people call the Ten Commandments. Everyone seems to know about a portion of scripture they call the Ten Commandments. They were written on tablets of stone, and they supposedly represent the baseline of morality for two religions, Judaism and Christianity. But... What exactly are they? First, they are never called the Ten Commandments in Scripture. It's quite odd that they ever earned this name. They are listed in Exodus 22 through 17 and Deuteronomy 5, 6 through 21. They are called the Ten Words. In Exodus 34, 28, Deuteronomy 4.13 and 10.4. It is from these three passages that they earn their title. In Hebrew, they are called as Aseret HaDevarim, the ten words. In Greek, in the Greek Septuagint, they are called Decalogos, ten words. In Latin Vulgate, they are Verba Decem, Decem, ten words. So how did they earn the English name, the Ten Commandments? The Wycliffe Bible, one of the earliest English Bibles, 1395 CE, translated Aseret HaDevarim as 10 words. The Coverdale Bible in 1535 CE translates the phrase as 10 verses. Virtually every English Bible from that time on has translated the phrase as 10 commandments. So what happened between the Wycliffe translation and the Bishop's Bible in 1568, the Protestant Reformation. The Geneva and Bishops well established the phrase, the Ten Commandments, but the authorized version, King James Bible of 1611, theologically sealed the matter. They were to be called the Ten Commandments from then on. So does it really matter? Certainly, the 10 words of Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 are imperatives, aren't they? Traditional Judaism lists them as part of the 613 mitzvot. So what difference does it make if they are incorrectly translated into English? Beloved, there's a reason they went from being words to commandments, and it isn't out of reverence for mitzvot. It's the opposite. The word Devarim words carries with it the promise of liberty and life. After all, we are to live by 
every word that proceeds from the mouth of Hashem, Deuteronomy 8.3. And our master quotes this to Satan in Matthew 4.4. 4. To some, the word commandments bears the appropriate negative connotation. There is a theological reason words became commandments. To be fair, some of the men of the Protestant Reformation considered these words as valid and operable in the lives of believers. Sadly, those same men were those that promoted a heretical theology called supersessionism or replacement theology. The real force behind the denigrating of the Ten Words is to be found in dispensationalism. It is there that the Ten Words became a relic of a past dispensation, the dispensation of law, quote unquote, which in the dispensationalist mind is the antithesis to the dispensation of grace. I know all too well this theology. I, I'm sure Emek can testify to it as well. I've heard it quite a bit, you know. It was not the same Ten Commandments that reduced these words of life to the law carved on stone in Christianity. It was the theology, whether supersessionist as with Roman Catholicism, Lutheranism, or Presbyterianism, or dispensationalism as with Baptist, Pentecostalism, or evang Evangelicalism, and sadly, some forms of Messianic Judaism. The theology aims to do the same thing as in this regard, relegate the 10 words to cold, hard tablets of stone. That is not what they are. They were delivered by the mouth of the almighty king of the universe to the ears of an entire nation at once. They came with sounds and sights that have never been experienced since. They were spoken audibly by the mouth of the master of all worlds. We could see those words as if sparks. Hashem himself carved them onto tablets twice. Our tradition tells us these tablets were miraculously carved in a way to be visible on both sides with the words suspended as if on air. Beloved, they are words of life. They are ten words. They are the summary of Hashem's self-revelation. Think about that for a moment. Everything that he said is found within these 10 words. And the first of them is, I am Hashem, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Exodus 22, this is his formal introduction to his bride. Never forget that. <clears throat> and that has stuck with me ever since I first read it. Okay, so Midrash Rabbah Ruth is what I'm reading right now. I'm in 7-2. And it's bringing down the six barleys that uh, Boaz gave to Ruth. So it means six barley grains, though he probably gave her more in addition. These were a hint that she would be blessed with six righteous descendants. You can see uh, Sanhedrin 93a and 93b. So the reward for, and he measured six barleys and laid them on her. He was vouchsafe that there would arise from her six righteous men, each one of them possessing six outstanding virtues. So King David, Hezekiah, Josiah, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Daniel, and the Mashiach. So if you remember the three Hebrew boys that were thrown in the furnace, that is, uh, those are descendants of Ruth and Boaz, also in the lineage of the Mashiach.
Sorry, got a wild sleeper going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it says that um, King David was skillful in playing and a mighty man of valor, a man of war and prudent in affairs and a comely person. And here we go with the manual and the Lord is with him. <laughs> <laughs> So King David could also be called Emmanuel. Yeah, Mashiach ben David. So what's really interesting too is Daniel is also in that same lineage. So when you look at uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they and Daniel are related. So when you read the book of Daniel and you read about like the challenges that they all went through, they're like, they're in the same line and the Mashiach comes from that, that line. And the six virtues, you ready? <laughs> so we know of this traditionally as applying to the Mashiach from Isaiah chapter nine. Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty, Strong, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So that applied to David, Hezekiah, Josiah, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, Daniel, and the Mashiach. And this little statement here that uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they're all uh, likened to one person. So the, why are they always coupled together as, or tripled together? The Midrash says that they are regarded as one. And it's interesting, too, that it's really more about Mishael and Azariah, that it's those two. Hananiah stands by himself, but he's usually lumped in with them, you know, in most accounts. So. Oh, my goodness. And King David longed and said, oh, that one would give me water. Water refers to the Torah. To drink of the well of Bethlehem, 2 Samuel 23, 15. Rabbi Hia said he was in need of a legal decision. And three mighty men broke through. Why three? Because a law cannot be decided except by three. Remember the two or more witnesses? You know, or two or three are gathered together. Every mm -hmm. matter will be established. And they drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. But he would not drink of it, i.e. he was unwilling that the law should be established in their name. So he made it an anonymous decision for future generations that a king may make a breach in order to make a highway and none may object. Yeah, I thought of John chapter four. Nice. Woman at the, woman at the well. <clears throat> I have water that to drink that you know not of. Or at the libation during Sukkot. Mm -hmm. Any man thirst, let him come to me.
or uh, and then uh, John seven thirty eight. <clears throat> if any man thirst, uh, he that believes on me, as the Scripture says, out of his innermost being <clears throat> will come rivers of living water. So here's another thing. So the transition from the time of the judges into the kings, it starts with Boaz. His son begins the line of kings since it was destined that Boaz and Ruth should be the progenitors of David and his descendants. So when we look at, um, while we read the book of Shavuot, or the book of Ruth during Shavuot, we're looking at the birth of the king. So the giving of the Torah is connected to the birth of the king. I've noticed that a lot of the Messiah figures, um, and you were just talking about David. Um, we know about Joseph as well, Samson, that they were handsome men, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And yet, while well, there's this prophecy in Isaiah. Yes. Prophecy that says, um, about the Messiah, he has no form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there shall be no beauty that we should desire him. Yes. I've been just wondering about that. Well, if you remember, um, when you study that section of Torah about Yosef being uh, beautiful, one of the things that caused his greatest test was him taking glory in his beauty. And that incited and stirred up uh, Potiphar's wife. So when Joseph began to recognize, oh, yeah, I am kind of cute. That's when he was faced with Potiphar's wife, which was a the, like a huge test so the whole thing about um the tacoon that needs to be made there because again he represents the mashiach on a, on a certain level and you have this whole picture of you know really bringing beauty to its uh its proper place that if you're focused more on your physical beauty you know, and you disregard modesty and things like that, you're just bringing trouble upon yourself. But the other part about why we would not esteem him was because he was taking upon himself our afflictions. So you know, you think about him being beaten, you think about him being rejected, you know, because take the beauty to an allegorical 
uh, standpoint of, you know, reputation, your name, you know, like when someone mentions a certain name, we can already begin to think about it, you know, especially if it's a popular name, we all know, you know, like if someone says Michael Jordan, we're like, oh man, Michael Jordan, you know, Space Jam, you know, will pop into some people's mind or dunking from the free throw line, you know, other people may have Shalom negative connotations, right? So when you think about the Mashiach, like what kind of beauty comes from the fact of, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we have done that he's going to repair, namely restore us back to the level of Adam before the sin of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So evoking that type of uh, reaction from the Mashiach, like the process that it's going to be to repair, like that means we have to realize we messed up, you know, like we're in a very, very bad way. Like when you think of a human being, you think of this, like the form we're in now, we get tired, we get old, we get sick human being did not mean that at that the beginning of creation human being was body of light all knowing you know taking dominion of the world being fruitful and multiplying living in the garden bringing glory to Hashem's name you know those kinds of things so now when we look at the Mashiach this is something we have to come to grips with like there are things that we need to fix <laughs> so who wants to look at their faults so another aspect of why we wouldn't esteem Mashiach, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's ugly, but uh, there's this is our, our shortcomings. We're looking at our shortcomings when we look at the Mashiach because he's going to he's going to cause us to have to deal with ourselves. And this is what I was actually sharing in the drosh um, yesterday that, you know, as we approach the arrival of the Mashiach, that we need to make sure that we're dealing with ourselves, so that nothing is left uncovered. Because there's nothing worse than putting on a front and then, you know, needing to be on, so to speak. The Mashiach shows up and it's like, yeah, take us to Israel, take us to the temple. But underneath the surface, we still have our little idolatries. We still have our little... Uh, uh, our little, uh, what do we want? What is that called? Like, not necessarily our quirks, but like our little things where it's just like these little paper cut type sins where, you know, it's not like full blown things that we do, but it's just kind of like, I have a little bit of pride or I have a little bit of hatred for so-and-so. I, I, um, I lie a little bit here and there, you know, those kinds of things. Like we need to really be going through ourselves like we did for the Omer count, searching out our hearts and finding all those dark, our vices. Thank you, Ellie Melik. Yes, those things. So when we look at the Mashiach, it's like, what are your vices? <laughs> you know, this is why it says he ate with the sinners and the tax collectors. On an allegorical level, eating means what you bring into yourself and when we talk about sinners and tax collectors these are some of like the most heinous types of actions that a person could do and so for him to eat with them you know it's like absorbing those impurities what what is our our sins what is our our horrible things that we need rectification and repair of the mashiach like takes that and absorbs that from us this is why we are called to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, because as we continue to be like, oh, yeah, this is a problem. I don't want that. You know, we have to begin to speak it out, confess it, you know, and yeah, it's a process because just because you go, yeah, I don't want to do this sin again. What if you did it again? You know, but if you repeat your sin, are you repeating it in the same intent and in the same mind frame, you know, in the psychological way? Did you even begin to think about ways that you could prevent yourself from that? Mm -hmm. Are you being honest with Hashem saying, you know what, this is a problem for me. And have you let him know about it? You know, because the people who were with Mashiach, like 
they were they knew they were bad <laughs> like it was just like yeah i'm a horrible person and i'm not, i can't hide it you know everything you know which makes the uh the rich young ruler account so powerful because he was just like what do i need to do what do i need to do and you was like what does the torah say he's like yeah yeah i'm doing that i'm doing that okay good sell everything you have and follow me I need you to really go there, you know, push yourself to the extreme. He's like, okay, that's a little too much. I think I'm going to, I need to think about this for a second, you know, and that's what we have to do. And so just to that whole aspect. And then it says here, when we saw him, he was so ugly and strange looking that we could not possibly desire him. So Rashi is like, for shot like the most simple plain meaning he's like yeah he actually is ugly <laughs> and then it says but now he has flourished and this is the mahari kara so there's going to be this whole makeover pun intended with the mashiach that he's going to go from ugly to like the most beautiful you know like people adore him it's like so amazing which is the difference between Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David. If you think about it right now, the people who are looking for the Mashiach, they want to skip the ben Yosef part. We don't want to talk about all that. <laughs> Let's just go straight to the kingship. It's glorious. We get to go home, you know, top of the world, kings and, and queens, you know, None of this poor stuff, none of this cut off and exiled and sitting at the gates of Rome with lepers. Like, nobody wants to be a leper. They're outside the city. They're excommunicated. Then it also says he was despised and isolated. Because here's another thing, isolation. When a lot of uh, what COVID caused was people having to stay isolated they couldn't go places there were shutdowns that was hard for some people a lot of people well that's another aspect of the mashiach is like he wasn't accepted so there has to be the the ability to uh to thrive and to flourish in a state of you know being separated cut off like we are learning, it, Israel has been learning this lesson for thousands of years that we've been away from our land. How are we going to do? How are we going to remain Jewish? Are we going to still uphold the the, the uh, standards of Torah? Like this is the lesson we've been learning, right? So that when we go back home, it's going to be like a breath of fresh air for us because it's like everything's going to be super easy now we're not going to have to struggle to find kosher restaurants we're not going to have to struggle to get a minion together at our shul you know we're going to be able to live in tight-knit communities where everything's so close by and so uh easy to access but we've already had the preparation of going through the hardships you know it's like a person who <laughs> has to work for their car as opposed to they're just given a car you know if you had to save up money and you know you got the hoopty first and then later you were able to get the fancy car it's like okay I'm it's like that rambo that i read earlier from devarine mm -hmm. you should be doing these things already yeah before you even went into exile you should be doing them so when you come go into exile and you come back to the land it, it will it'll will just be subconscious you'll just simply do it because it's in your heart. And you that's know, the appearance. The thing of about it is, what did we hear in the church all the time? All this stuff super spiritualized. Minus the physical aspect of the performance of a mitzvot. The, the act of performing a mitzvot, that's what's going to get in here. This is That's what's going to change you. That's what's going to elevate your consciousness. And you begin to have a deeper connection with Hashem. And it becomes more personal for you. And other people are going to see that, especially if you're in a tight-knit community and they see that. Considering what I read from Path of the Just yesterday, <clears throat> um, we shouldn't be out there looking for honor, prestige, praise from men. 
If you are looking for that stuff, you need to do a heart check. You need to do a motive check. Why? There's only one reason for the performance of a mitzvah. It is for the sake of heaven. Lama An Shamahim. Mm -hmm. The honor of the Holy One, blessed be he, that his name may be sanctified among the nations, especially if us, you know, mm -hmm. to purify ourselves. <clears throat> you know, that I'll tell you right now, that's one book I'm just going to constantly read through all the time until it gets in here. Until I can start quoting that, that verbatim, you know. Because that's the reason why it's the Ram calls magnum opus, you know. So basically, Yosef was, you know, beautiful looking and all the other people that we've mentioned, you know, and then it's like the Mashiach is like blend. <laughs> so as we look at this, uh, it's so beautiful that this is the picture of exile versus the picture of Geula, the picture of uh, being in a place of... Uh, outside the land, you know, no temple to being in the land, the redemptions happened, resurrection, all these kinds of things. So that's like a total makeover. So that that even shows itself in the verse and especially the commentary we just read, Rashi's like, he's ugly. Maharakar is like, he's <laughs> flourishing. He's beautiful. He's amazing. And if you think about even in the gospels, it points this out that what was it, what was he like post-resurrection? People were not even able to recognize him. That's how much he changed. That's almost like he's quoting the sages in Barakot, you know, where's Mashiach, you know, and he's in chains, imprisoned in Rome, unrecognizable, you know? Yeah, I always, always wondered why he wasn't recognizable. Well, for one thing, his yeah. Jewishness was stripped by Christianity. You know. It was turned into a pagan god, basically. No, but I mean at the resurrection. Yeah. Why they didn't, why people oh. recognize him. That's so good. Yeah. That's why when I stopped about that and meditate on that, I realized there's a mystical aspect to that. I think we I'm a Don Conroe. Pardon? I think of, you know, Kabbalistically, I think of Adam Kadmon, in other words, Yeshua. You know, when he first, what was it? Uh, it was Martha that ran up to him. And what was what did the master tell her not to do? Not to touch him. Oh, Miriam. And, Miriam. And, and, yeah, Miriam. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay, so why did he tell her not to touch him? Well, I thought it was because he needed to ascend to yeah, present. I haven't ascended yet. Yeah. And she would have made him Tame, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was to whore, but she was to me. Ellie Malik is bringing down that he was a Nazir. Yeah. Which is the, the Nazarite vow, which yeah. is the next Torah portion, Parshan Naso. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, um, there's some com uh, there's some that say that about Shaul that he took on the vow of a Nazarite and never could complete it. Oh, he did. He did take it on. He paid for other people to do it too. Oh yeah, I think it's Acts chapter twenty. Yeah, it's in there. Um, but he himself, I don't think he was able to uh, complete it because he was executed by the Romans. Yeah, I think he was in the middle of the process when the, the riot started that put him on trial. They started having a... Yeah, before Festus. And, uh, where he gave his testimony to them. You know? Um, but yeah, when Yeshua was resurrected, you know, I, I think of the rectification of Adam HaRishon um, where in some ways he uh, showed us what the primordial man should was like 
you know, clothed in light. You know, so you have this play on he, two Hebrew words where or, which is spelled Aleph, Bav, Resh, which has a gematria of 207. And then after the sin, when they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the, the Aleph got changed, exchanged for an Ayin. So now, or skin. And what's also interesting is if you, there's two Hebrew words, there's zakar, which is male, and nekiva, which is female. If you take the gematria of nekiva and subtract it from zakar, you have 70, which is the gematria for the letter ayin, which is also the word for I. And so, and Eve looked upon the tree, the fruit, and saw that it could make one wise. So kind of an allusion to what the two commentators are saying about uh, what Mashiach looked like, you know. You know, the Rashi saying, oh, he's ugly. You don't want to look at him, you know. And then the other one saying, oh, he's Yafe Mayo. He's beautiful, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I get more drops in the cephalene group. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's no end to what this guy can find, man. <laughs> I'd Samaic Ronnie driving to New York or driving to Buffalo, New York. That's pretty cool. You're listening in. Oh. <laughs> Stay safe out there. Yeah, that's a late night drive. Yep. I'm really excited. My sister's on here. Oh, nice. nice. That's, that's Lori. Oh, ah, okay. Very good. Yeah. Keep it in the family. She's <laughs> the only one. My one and only. <laughs> A true blessing and gift from Hashem that she's on this walk with me. Beautiful. Yeah. Because my whole family is in the church other than her. Oh, okay. Well, may they be attached to you both yeah. and drawn closer to a shim yeah. as you draw closer to a shim. That's well, the same with us. You know, we share a tour with uh, both sides of the family. <laughs> Actually, my mother, um, she was born in Germany and during her teen years, she was in a Lutheran school. <laughs> but she started asking questions of these guys and pretty soon they like were like getting tired of it. Can you like not send your daughter to our school anymore? <laughs> But then she got annoyed and said, you know, I had enough of this. You guys won't answer my questions, you know. She was kind of. But then, you know, so many years later, you know, I start sitting down and talk to talking to her about Torah. And she actually sat there and listened to me instead of fighting. Because when I was in the church, she was very resistant. She would not listen at all. 
but it wasn't until I started living Torah that she actually listened. She even actually said, so Ricky, are you Jewish now? <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> At least my wife thought so. <laughs> I look at it as a compliment, though. But yeah, it is interesting, you know, how things happen, you know. When you get out of a religious system, man-made system of do's and don'ts, and you start walking the way <clears throat> Hashem wants you to. How things just happen, the things he brings about, you know, opens doors that were just previously closed, you know, to sharing and planting a seed, you know. Okay, here we go. Midrash Rabbah Ruth 3 2. It says, And King David died on Shabbat, which coincided with Shabbat. And the Sanhedrin went up to present themselves to Shlomo. He said to them, Move him from place to place. They said to him, but does not a Mishnah state that a corpse may be anointed and washed as long as the limbs are not moved? He said to them, the dogs of my father's house are hungry. They answered him, does not a Mishnah state that the pumpkins may be cut off or may be cut on the Shabbat for an animal and a carcass for dogs? What did he do? He took a curtain and spread it over the body that the sun should not beat down on it. While others explain, he summoned eagles who spread their wings over him that the sun should not beat down upon him. So you remember this one time where they wrapped Yeshua's body in a linen cloth and put him in a tomb. And that's how they, that's what they did to King David. <laughs> Because it was the Shabbat, and they couldn't really do a proper prepare, proper prepare for burial for him. Because he died on a Shabbat, which was also a Yom Tov. Just like Yeshua, he died on the day that preceded a Shabbat, which was also a Yom Tov. Wow. Now, what's interesting is King Shlomo summoning eagles to cover the body of King David. Solomon is said to have had complete control over nature. <laughs> okay. It's like, you know what I need right now? I need some eagles. <laughs> Well, Yeshua had control over nature. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. But of course. <laughs> wow. Let's read the chat over here. It's getting real. So, Yosef's brother, his name is Brad, today posted a well-explained not Nazir vow, a Nazarite vow, between Yosef ben Yaakov and Yeshua. Because if, if everyone doesn't know, Yosef of uh, Yaakov's sons took upon himself a Nazarite vow that as long as his family was separated while he was in Egypt, he would not drink wine. 
which is why when the brothers were all together and they finally got to have that meal where everyone um, sat around the table drinking, that was the first time Yosef had wine because it, everybody was back together. So it says the gospels tell us that during the crucifixion, Yeshua was twice offered vinegar, literally sour wine. The first time he refused it, however, at the point of death and the ultimate ritual defilement through uncleanliness, he accepted it. How is it possible that he would break his vow to not drink of the fruit of the vine if the vow was a Nazarite vow? It would be defunct at that or at the point of death because of his contact with death. Very good point. I actually just went to Parsha Naso and was reading it. Uh, it's in Numbers chapter, I believe, six. Yes, number six. It says that verse six all the days that he abstains as a Nazir before Hashem. He shall not enter under the same roof of, as a soul of the dead, even to his father, to his brother, to his sister, or to, or yeah, to his sister. He shall not be contaminated to them upon their death, for the crown of his God is upon his head. Throughout the passage, the word Nazir is always rendered the same in the sense of Nazi wrote. Nazi root by Unkelos. This is the only instance where it's translated differently as the word for crown. As the most constantly visible sign of his separation from temptation is the Nazir's unshorn hair is a crown of loyalty to Hashem. And he is forbidden not only to come in contact with a corpse, but even to enter beneath the same roof as a corpse. So that's number chapter six. So Yeshua becomes a corpse. <laughs> so yeah, the whole thing as far as a Nazarite vow and the whole thing about having to be separated from death. Well, if the Nazarite dies, he's getting contaminated with death. So it says, because of his contact with death, hence he refused the vinegar earlier, but received it at the moment of his death. Both the vinegar and the death sever the vow. The master's acceptance of his vinegar, or of the master's acceptance of his, of the vinegar symbolizes his acceptance of death. A vow severed by corpse contact can be entered only after purification. The master's resurrection is his purification from death. That's beautiful. So him actually accepting the, the wine was him really saying, yeah, I'm dying. The death of the Mashiach, which is... If you uh, search the topic death of the Zadik, that tells you everything you need to know about that. So again, absorbing our impurities, how many times do we make vows and break them? There's a whole section of Yom Kippur known as uh, Kol Nidre, which is all vows. And that's the first step of atonement and purification is to nullify and confess any vows that you've made knowingly and unknowingly, anything you may have failed in upholding. So as you enter into the process of atonement, you have to acknowledge that vows have been broken or they've been made without your knowledge or you've mistakenly done so. So it's like really cool that that's the prerequisite for atonement. And John 19, 28, Yeshua knew that everything was now finished and to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. Come on. Wow. 
Wow. Wow. <laughs> Love it. Oh, bringing it. <laughs> the boom. <laughs> I'm just reading this uh, website that uh, Shauna put up in the chat earlier mm -hmm. about the fulfilling. The everlasting water that would quench the thirsty woman at the well. So these are the waters of life, basically. Because it, it says that Hashem is, is going to resurrect us in the future with dew, which is basically water. You know, that's how man was created. A nice. dew overshadowed or was above the soil and then Hashem with both hands created I mean there's another uh, interpretation on the two yods and uh, by Yetzer that with both hands Hashem created man which denotes great care hmm. that he formed man of the earth uh, Edema. And then within that word you have Adam. But then you can distill it down further. Dam, blood. The life is in the blood. So the whole thing about the beautiful appearance. So in Midrash Rabbah, Kohelet, which is Ecclesiastes, it says, as is the good. This alludes to David, of whom it is written, and goodly to look upon. First Samuel 16, 12. Rabbi Yitzhak said he was goodly to look in the halakha and how and whoever looked at him remembered his learning mm -hmm. wow so the beautiful appearance helps you remember your torah learning so this is the zit zit so when we look at our zit zit it helps us to remember the the mitzvot So King David looking beautiful help people remember their Torah. <laughs> wow. So Mashiach in his resurrected form, like looking up on him who we have pierced, like that helps us remember to repent, return to Hashem, but walk in his ways, which is why the resurrection of Mashiach is so important that if we're really proclaiming his resurrection, how are we living Boy, y'all are going crazy with these gospel drops in the pat in the uh, chat. <laughs> so in. Um... Leviticus chapter 16, verse 13, 
It says the cloud of incense may cover. Again, Midrash Rabbah Kohelet. It says, we did not know what the purpose of this covering was until King David came and explained it. As it is said, you have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have pardoned all their sins. A passage from Psalms. And it says, likewise, spoke the Holy One, blessed is he. More dear to me is the handful of fl flour brought by a poor man as a voluntary meal offering than the two handfuls of incense offered by the high priest. Speaking of the Yom Kippur offering. Why? Because the high priest is brought to that offering is brought to secure atonement, but not the poor person, as it is written. And when anyone brings a meal offering unto Hashem, the poor man's offering is brought from a disinterested motive. The statement of Rabbi Yitzhak should come at the end of the paragraph and is meant as a proof that the incense offered by the Kohen was for the purpose of securing atonement. So King David was the one who was the person who gave us the explanation of the purpose of the cloud of incense that came from the Yom Kippur offering. which is crazy because the incense for Yom Kippur to bring atonement, like we're, we're seeking to, to do something. It's motivated by something. Whereas the poor person who's voluntarily bringing the offering, it's, it's coming from like, I'm not trying to seek anything. I'm just really looking for, you know, I'm bringing something to Hashem kind of thing. And Hashem says the poor man's voluntary offering is more dear to him than the high priest offering on Yom Kippur. That's crazy. So speaking to the fact of when we do things for Hashem, like there's the whole uh, Hashem, if you just get me out of the situation, I promise I'll do, you know, da, 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 as opposed to this is how I live because I love God. So Halakhic Dawn, 
in our area here in Dallas is 4.51 a.m. It is currently 4.21 a.m. So to have been considered to stay up all night studying Torah, we only got about 30 minutes. <laughs> got my coffee i know i can go longer but i don't know about anybody else <laughs> it's 2 30 on the west coast dawn uh, is at 2 30 it's only oh. two oh gotcha gotcha california no um western canada oh uh, british western columbia right? canada wow uh, So by the time it's 4.51 there, it'll be sunrise where we are. Yep. I dropped a couple more verses. <laughs> Share them. Speak them out. Um. <laughs> 2.22 a.m. <laughs> See, as Yeshua passed along, he saw a man blind from birth. His Talmudim asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, to cause him to be born blind? Yeshua answered, his blindness is due neither to his sin nor to that of his parents. It happened so that God's power might be seen at work in him. As long as it is day, we must keep doing the work of the one who sent me. The night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And then I thought of Vayikra 1914. Do not speak a curse against a deaf person or place an obstacle in the way of a blind person. Rather, fear your God. I am Adonai. So I want to bring down something from Parshat Korach from the Rebbe. He says there are two types of miracles. So if you remember in that Torah portion, they take all the staffs from each of the leaders of the tribes, including the tribe of Levi, and they place them in the, in the tabernacle before the ark. And Aaron's staff buds and blossom almonds overnight. So with that context, the first type of miracle is a confrontational miracle. It overpowers and displaces the natural, the norm, creating a reality that is completely contrary to nature's laws. Think about the splitting of the sea. Think about, uh, you know, water from the well, those types of things. It says, and then there's the natural miracle which though it may be no less impossible by the standard of norms, no less obvious a display of the hand of God, nevertheless occurs by natural means, employing natural phenomena and, pro and processes to achieve its end. And I would just point out the conception of the Mashiach, you know, in his birth, he was like, through the natural process of, you know, that, is how he came into creation. It says, to understand the difference between these two, we need to examine the purpose of miracles in general. The word for miracle means aloft and elevated. 
the regularity and predictability of nature creates so-called laws. This is why it says natural order. And you cannot but conform to this defined and bounded reality. The truth, however, is otherwise. Man and his world have been imbued by their creator with the potential to raise and elevate their existence, to go beyond what is dictated by the quote unquote way things are. A miracle with its open display of divine power has an uplifting effect whose experience on those who experience it, enabling them to see through the facade of nature and inspiring them to transcend the perceived limitations of their own nature and the accepted norms of their society. At first glance, it may seem that nature's, nature's miracles need to resort to natural processes. The fact that it does that, making it uh, less of a miracle. Well, in truth, a miracle that works through nature is even more elevating, i.e. it's more miraculous than a miracle that supersedes it. A sudden shattering change has not transformed nature, but only gone beyond it. But when a miracle is integrated into the workings of nature, nature itself is elevated. A supra-natural miracle liberates the person who experiences it from the natural order. A natural miracle liberates the very substance of the natural order itself. Again, that's from the, the Rebbe. What's awesome about that is this is what the Mashiach Ben Yosef has done. He's brought the natural miracle where we get to elevate the natural. This is why it's you can't just go, well, he can't be the Mashiach because look, we're still sinning and there's no world peace. But what is the process that's happening through the Mashiach Ben Yosef? He's extracting the impurities of the evil inclination. He's extracting what's known in uh, Kabbalah as the Sitra Akra from the world, the venom of the serpent. Just like when we counted the Omer, we didn't count the Omer in one night. We took 49 days and we went through each little aspect one by one, you know, and like through this whole process now, we've elevated ourselves on in a natural way in a more impacting way and a more lasting way and so i just love that whole aspect of the uh the natural miracles because that brings everything up and it's not something that's temporary and it's not something that's fleeting because it's like if god comes in shows up takes away your sin it's like okay go do whatever you want to do it's like what impact does that really have on your life as opposed to you slowly progressing and getting better this is why getting sick as horrible as it is is probably one of the best things for us because it literally <laughs> strengthens our bodies and we we get stronger Bezrat Hashem through our healing you know if we actually deal with what causes the sickness as opposed to just what are the ailments you know it's like oh I got a headache let me just take some Tylenol it's like what's causing the headache you start dealing with our sicknesses from that we're really elevating our bodies. We really do become stronger, you know? So anyway. Well, since you got on the subject of Korak, I went to that. Takun Leo Salahot. The Arizal connects Korak's rebellion back to the narrative of Cain and Hevel. <laughs> Cain had brought an offering to God, which wasn't of the best quality. Unlike Hevel's, God accepted Hevel's pure offering, but not Cain's, which drew the latter's ire. Moreover, Jewish tradition holds that Cain was born with a female twin, and Hevel was born with two female twins. Since Cain was older and the firstborn deserves a double portion, he felt that Hevel's second female twin should be married to him. Evil reasoned that since he that since she was born along with him, he was destined to marry her. 
This resulted in a brawl, which ended with Cain's, Cain's murder of Hevel. In an attempt to hide his crime, Cain quickly buried Hevel's body in the ground. Depending on how Genesis 4.15 is read, one can understand that Cain's crimes could be avenged sevenfold. Shevatim uh, Yakam. The Arizal teaches that the term Yokam Avenge stands for three people, Yitro, Korach, and the Mitzri. Cain's soul split in three and reincarnated in these individuals in order to rectify his sins. Meanwhile, the soul of Hevel reincarnated primarily into Moshe. When Moshe killed the Mitzri, the Egyptian slave master, justice was served for the fact that Cain had killed Hevel. When Moshe married Yitro's daughter, justice was served since Cain had stolen Hevel's female twin. Finally, Korak had an opportunity to repair his sin of a faulty offering in his past life. Instead, his impure, impure offering was once more rejected by God, just as Cain's was. And this time, God had Korak swallowed up by the earth the self same earth within which Cain's buried Hevel in his anger. Thus, Cain's sins were rectified and justice was entirely served measure for measure. Sha'ar ha pesukim, Bereshit, Simon 4. Love it. Hmm. Watch out for that deja vu. It will bite you. Then I have to check out. Yeah, I love the fact that you brought up that uh, Cayenne and Hevel were born with uh, twins, twin sisters. Because many people ask, how did we uh, get so many people in the world? By the time Cain was sent into exile, like who were the people he was afraid of? And so we should know that the uh, everyone was born with a sister. And from there, that's where the, the people came from. Uh, yeah, so I went there. Yeah, greatness of Cain has known the firstborn as a great advantage, as mentioned in Tikkunin, Tikkunin, Tikkun 67, and a few discussions on how Cain and Hevel contain both good and evil except that the evil Cain overcame the evil Hevel and was rectified through Yitro and onward. As Hava hinted when she said, I have acquired Kenisi, a man with God, Bereshit 4.1. His rectification would be through Yitro, who was called Keni. Then an additional level was rectified. Not only this, but the Holy One, blessed is he, spoke to him face to face as it says, God said to Cain, etc. Bereshit 4, 6. It's just that even after he sinned and killed his brother, the Holy One, blessed be he, however, did speak with his brother, Hevel, at all.
I was looking at a Zohar for bearish heat, and it talks about when Adam and Hava were created. It says that they were like Siamese twins conjoined back to back. This single being is that which is described in Genesis 127. And the forming of Eve from Adam's rib or side in the following chapter is the separation of this pair in which they are first turned face to face to one another so that they might meet, see one another, and unite and propagate the species fulfilling God's first command. The Kabbalists claim that in this sense too, humans are made in God's image, which is the whole picture of Teferd and Malkut, which is beauty and kingdom being a single unity. And they had to be sawed apart in a violent uh, choice of verb, which is a violent choice of verb, so that they might be properly united. Only through this union does divine life begin to flow outward, giving life to the worlds below. In order for our life to come about, in other words, God had to undergo a transformative act of great pain, one in which the divine becomes separated from itself, its future reunification to depend entirely upon the actions of the creatures below. Here in exile and our suffering and our inherit in the cosmos and the balm provided by human goodness is somewhat more superficial and oasis of relief in the wandering that is indeed the necessary human and cosmic condition. So I just find it very interesting that my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? <laughs> like that's a pain of separation, which brought about a transformative act to bring forth. What does it say? So in order for our life to come about, in other words, God had to undergo a transformative act of great pain. So through the death and the separation that happened with Hashem and his Mashiach, that brought life to us, life to the worlds. So, Zohar Bereshit, a great act of pain <laughs> on Hashem's part brings life to worlds below. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, the Ari continues here. Um, Cain, Hevel, and Shesh. That will explain the three brothers, the sons of Adam, Harishon, Cain, Hevel, and Shesh. In a discussion, of, discussion about the sin of Adam, Harishon, it was explained that he caused a blemish to Zeranpin, Leah, and Raquel. Look there at the matter carefully. Thus included in the blemishes was that the brain of Da'at of Zerampin descended to the chest, and there the five Kassadim were detained from emanating through the body of Zer, and they did not descend. Uh, he froze. <laughs> Come back, Shlomo. <laughs> Which, by the way, I'm looking up the whole uh, death removes the curse. Because I've been meaning to um, put that teaching together. So I'm just trying to go to the source in Deuteronomy. That's not it over there. Did anyone ever uh, talk about that subject to your knowledge, Shauna, on uh, Strictly Torah? about the death removing the curse 
I don't know. There's so much that goes flying by on that chat. Okay. <laughs> it moves at warp speed. Gotcha. <laughs> oh, Shomo's back. Hey, you froze uh, up, bro. Uh, connection acted up. <laughs> Does that sometimes. Well, feel free to pick up where you left off. Uh, let's see. Cain and Hevel were born after the blemish and the sin of Adam HaRishon. Then the upper Adam and Hava, Zerampin and Nukva also paired and gave birth to the upper Cain and Hevel as it writes at the end of Adoret Naso. It was exactly the way that Adam and Hava below gave birth to the lower Cain and Hevel. <clears throat> I think what the Ari is pointing to is that when um, I mentioned it earlier is that when they were clothed in the ore, the light of the um, ore in Sof, Adam caught Moan, but when he partook, when the upper Adam partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then he descended down to the level of, of the knowledge of good and evil. So now we have the lower Adam, which gives of Cain of Adam and Hevel, who gave birth, as the Ari says here, to the lower Cain and Hevel. In other words, if those two did not sin, the sin of Adam Harishon didn't happen, then Cain and Hevel would not be what they were after, afterwards, after the sin. Hmm. And this next part kind of touches on what you were reverse situation. It is known that each pairing between parts of theme, which is persona, requires hmm. main decorine, male waters of the of the male, which is five kasadim within him, and Mayin Nukvin, female waters, which is her five gavuros. Here it happened in reverse. The male drop of Mayin Dekurin was the level of the gavuros that emanated through him while the Kasadim remained in the Da'at. Not only this, there were only three gavuros and not all five. In his Nukva, there was another charge. This female is called Hava, which is Raquel, the house mistress. And as previously explained, there was a blemish in her as well, and as much as she descended and began at the end of the upper third of Yesod of Zer and emanated down into Berea. This was not the case with Leo, who was a complete part Suf. She descended from her place and therefore remained completely in Atsilu. So remind me that Levan deceived Yaakov into marrying Raquel, but not Leah. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean? When, when Yaakov went to Levan, right? And he, who did he want to marry? He wanted Ra Raquel. Yeah, but instead he got Leia. Mm -hmm. So, so what really is going on here is when the Ari says that was not the case of Leia, who was a complete part suit, she descended from her place and therefore remained completely an absolute. This is why Yaakov had the level of prophecy in Vayaki. Because prophecy usually emanates from Atsilu if you merit it. And apparently Yaakov possibly did in this case hmm. by, by marrying Leah. So Laban's deception actually backfired on him. I mean, that's typically the case. 
because if anyone is trying to, uh, you know, do something that is contrary, I mean, we Parsha Balak, where Balaam is trying to curse the children of Israel, he tried three times <laughs> and it backfired. And instead comes out the oldest blessing in the Sidur. And we should know this is the same thing with crucifying the Mashiach. Yeah. That ultimately there was a lot of hatred, animosity, and jealousy that caused it. But in the end, it ended up being the deliverance for all mankind. Yeah. So, since five Kassadim did not emanate through the body of Zeranpin as he was accustomed, for the reason mentioned above, the five Gavuros of the Nukva, which is Leah, did not emanate through her body as she was accustomed. Instead, five Kassadim emanated from her Hased until her Hod, and they all went down to her, Yasod and were the level of Mayin Nukvin within her. But Raquel was not a complete part Suf, because there was no place for her to stand in Atsilut, as mentioned. Therefore, she did not have any Mayin Nukvin at all. So when Zerapin and Nukva Raquel paired to bring out the upper Kain and Hevel, it was in the following way. Raquel ascended in Atsilut, to the place Leo was standing and took her Mayim Nukvin on loan, Basod, what is written in Sefer HaZohar in the introduction to Bereshit regarding the matter of mother lends her clothing to her daughter on the verse, these things I will remember and will pour out to Helam 42.5. Then she paired with Zerampin, and Zerampin gave to her through the pairing the level of Mayim <coughs> Dekurim, which were the three Gaburos that emanated to his neck, sock, bone, and Yasod, as mentioned, although not completely, but only two and two thirds Gaburos became because they were revealed. The upper third in Yasod is a hidden light because until there, uh, Adaret Ha Yasod of Ima emanated clothing that third, but the two Gaburos in the Netzach and Hold are revealed. This is understandable with what has been mentioned above in the discussion about the sin of Adam Harishon. The main descending of Ima was the level of her middle line, her Yasod, which descended until the upper third of Yasod of Zer but her two other lines, the right and left, remain as they were before. Thus only two and two thirds revealed Gaburos went down to below at the time of pairing as mentioned, but so a drop of Mayim Dekurim because the upper third is covered in Yasod and cannot descend. Raquel is female elevated. Raquel's female elevated the five Gaburos she borrowed from Leah as Mayim Nukvin, as mentioned, then she gave birth to Kaim, who included the two and two thirds Gaburus called Tiferet, Netzak, and Hod, and the five female Gaburus of Leah. Altogether, there were seven and two thirds Gaburus in Kaim. Yeah, so he was pretty much all left access of the tree of life. Gabur of Ima. So any wonder he got into a tussle with uh, Hevel over the offerings. <laughs> okay, so I find it peculiar that we had our own census two years ago now, but it seems like we're living in the reading of Hosea 2, 1 through 22. 
Yeah, that was the Haftar for Parsha Bamibar. What census? I guess you and Ellie Malik are in the same area, or at least in the same time zone. Ellie Malik, what you talking about, man? Oh, <laughs> oh America had a census. Yes. Oh. Two years ago. 2020. Yeah, I remember. Man, that was just before COVID, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Oh, my goodness, man. We Census before the plague. Are you serious? Oh, my. Well, they want to know how many people died. Or how many people they killed with the vaccine. Yeah, yeah. And that when did we serious. get counted in the wilderness? Wow. That's wow. Okay. Even those who behave like the Arab Rob still carry out in Shem's will. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right then. <laughs> yeah. Cause you know, if we if we look at uh the significance of what he's talking about now, you know, like <clears throat> as we're moving and transitioning into more phases of getting ready for the final redemption because we're in the middle of it right now you know and there's a lot of uh, trials that we have to overcome and if you think about when the last census was taken versus you know whatever that number looks like now I don't know if they're what the census plan is going forward but after the golden calf we were counted after the plague that um, we had with the incident of Shatim, which led to Parsha Pankis. We were counted after that, you know, so they, there was a census in Canada too. Okay. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, Rashi's right. comment on Bamibar says he counted them because they were dear to him. Get you some. So are we dear to Hashem? We who are alive? That's right to show. And look how Canada is being tested with their own wicked rulers. <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah. Look what happened with the Freedom Convoy up there. Trudeau just went off the rails, man. They, accusing the truckers of being Nazis when he himself oh. is behaving in that very same manner. It's so nasty here. We're prisoners in our own country if we're not vaccinated. We literally yeah. cannot leave. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So wow. I'm counting on some kind of uh yes. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch scenario. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh boy. It's possible. Or Elijah. You know, there's this guy on YouTube. I'm in uh, Sean James. You might know about him. Um, he, he lives completely off grid in Ontario province. And he's in the middle of building a new cabin. He's got his own greenhouse. I mean, this guy is totally set. <laughs> he's, he's not dependent on anybody, you know. Our hope should only be in our shoe. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like those are the circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, he's not like one of those doomsday preppers. Those guys you gotta stay away from. You know, those guys—they're so full of conspiracy theories, man. You don't even want to give them the time of day. Of, you know. But, well, I think yeah. that's part of the the time before Mashiach arrives too. There will be a lot of conspiracy theories. Yeah. That we have to navigate oh. through. Yeah, isn't there a verse about that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Luke uh, twenty-one. No, it's no, it's it's in it's in the prophets. Yeah, I don't remember the source offhand. I just remember that just recently this week that was part of the the understanding about the final redemption. As we get closer to it, conspiracy theories will be a thing. Um, there's a Tanya 
about the uh, Citra Acra having to release the light that it has concealed. And as it's releasing that light, it convulses and it basically shapeshifts where it's like one moment it's this, one moment it's that, one moment is this, one moment is that. You know how we went from COVID is like the main thing. And then uh, before that, there was like this whole thing with racism. And then oh, now yeah. it's now you got monkey box. <laughs> and then it's going to be something else. That's this whole process of the Citra Acre releasing the light it comes out in this chaotic format. But as we should know, when you uh, look at the world of chaos versus the world of repair, like you have to get light from the chaos and bring it into a vessel. You have to harness it. You have to channel it. And what, what should be happening as we go through these times is it should draw us closer to a shem it's also drawing out more people from the darkness so that we truly, the sifting process basically is happening. Like you really know who's for Hashem because we're getting pushed more and more into a position of like, we need to understand Hashem can override a lot of the protocols. You know, like we need Hashem to do big things like he did for us in Egypt. Egypt was very oppressive to us. They did not want to let us leave. Somebody just said, we're prisoners in our own country. They're not going to leave Canada. <laughs> <laughs> well, guess what? It says that there was never a single person who was able to escape the borders of Egypt. But when it came time for the exodus, a whole nation was able to leave. So may I, that be so for all, all people, global, because who knows what governments are trying to do to keep people prisoners in their own countries. We're probably all going to need that type of Braca. And it's going to happen. Yeah. But if we I, don't do Sin that. Hashem, that's, that's not going to happen. So we're I mean, literally going to have to have some radical trust, like in your face type trust. Well, that would mean a complete disconnect from of dependence. Yeah. Don't, don't cling to the government. Yeah. But rather devok, cling to Hashem, like a man clings to his wife. Yeah. You know? And you have to do it. And just absolute. See, this is the thing though. This is Israel. This is what they have to do. Otherwise, because they're light to the nations, if Israel falls off the map spiritually, the whole world's gonna go down in the tank. And that's not gonna happen. And yeah, Hashem won't allow that to happen. You know, he judges Israel on a progressive scale. You know, okay, you guys, hey, I'll just up the ante, you know. You just keep being disobedient, you know. I'll just, okay, I'll just keep raising the difficulty level, you know. And by the way, we should not allow that to happen. It shouldn't be just us depending on Hashem to not cause it to happen. We're oh, no, partners no. with Hashem. Like we have to understand this too. Like so much, I think of our life, especially for me, I don't know about anyone else's story, but growing up in a different faith where you're like, oh, God's going to do it. I'm just going to be over yeah. here. You know, I'm going to trust in him. Everything's going to be all right. Just pray about it and just go Give back to God. Day. How many times have you heard that one? <laughs> but that doesn't work with Israel. <laughs> Israel is called to partner with Hashem and creation. We're called to take dominion in the world. If we see problems in the world, we need to be doing things to handle it. We need to be making changes in our life that will cause overthrows and tearing up of evil decrees. We have the power, we have the authority as Israel to say, you know what? I'm not okay with this corruption in the government. Hashem, bring order to the government. Why is there a specific bracha in the Shimoni Esrei, which is called prayer? Three times a day, we're praying for the restoration of a proper and kosher government. We need to be believing that Hashem is going to restore order to the chaos. And we need to like mean it. We don't need to just see our prayer time as like, here's our formal structure. Like, make sure we pray from the Sidur. It's like, no, 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 no. 
take authority in that. We have to do that. As Israel, we have the ability. And so as we're being pushed into this position, which I've, I feel like we are, I feel like since, you know, all the isolation, government shutdowns, inflation, crazy prices on stuff, like we're getting pushed to a position of like, don't get comfortable. You know, like we're so used to going to work and getting a paycheck, all this kind of stuff. Or like when Israel and Jeremiah State kept crying out the temple, the temple, the temple. And Shem says, hey, that's not going to get you anywhere. I'm done with your vain offerings. You bring them just out of road. You don't bring them because your kavana is in it. Your heart is in it. Don't waste my time with these offerings. They stink to me. Yeah. That that has been so misinterpreted, especially Psalm 51. You know, Lev Tahor Bara the Elohim Bekir B. What the real meaning of that psalm is create in me a clean heart so that when I do bring these offerings, I'm in the right place spiritually. Mm -hmm. I'm clean spiritually, not just physically. Because the performance of a physical act should always come from within. The two are not mutually exclusive. Being cannot be distinct from doing. Yeah. They're, they're not mutually exclusive. That's the thing that David was getting across, I think, in that psalm. You know, and my lips will declare your truth. Sinners will do to Shuba when I talk to them. You know, you, this is the other this is the other thing that we have to do is plant seeds in other people because Shem's gonna put people in our path. He's done it with you, he's done it with me, even my wife, you know, family members, all that's happening. I, I see that too. And Hashem's gonna put you in a place where, hey, speak up for me, say something. You need to do you have to do this. This is part of the rectification of creation to bring creation back to that point. You know, this is the true path of the Zadik is to bring those uh, part pieces of holiness that yeah. shattered from the shattering of the vessels because creation could not contain the perfection that the state that it was in. And so now the Zadik and Yeshua were showing us how to do this is to bring this about, you know, the, and the only reason why wicked men are in power right now is because we really don't speak out. And we're sitting there letting them pass all these censorship laws and big tech is behaving the way they are because we're not doing anything about it. But when we, like you said, when we get more serious about prayer, about Torah, about truly leaving it out, not just learning about it, of course, but so that people can see, oh, that person's different. You know, there's something in them, you know? I got, I got to ask that guy some questions, you know. I said, what is it about you, you know, Rick? You know, what's different about you, you know? I said, okay, I, hey, you know, I'll, I'll explain it to you, you know. Um, you know, like, uh, like Elon Musk, when he bought, decided to buy Twitter, everybody just went nuts. <laughs> I mean, that was just so... <laughs> You know, that's what we're going to get is this pushback from the world. You know, so I don't want nothing to do with that. You know, we're going to, you can't talk about Torah, you know, in, in public, you know, that kind of thing, you know, uh, expressions of faith in a, in a public setting, you know, that kind of thing. That's what they're afraid of. You know, those who are so uh, far from Torah that, you know, that, their conscience um, is seared with the hot iron, like Shaul says. Yeah, that's true, Elimelech, man. If there wasn't a Zadik in the world, it would be a whole lot worse. <laughs> but there are, thankfully, you know. And I mean, there's people like us, you know, just like dropping stuff on Facebook, I mean, I'm dropping stuff everywhere now, man. I'm like uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Tumblr, 
just wherever I can get it out there, you know, a vehicle of, you know, expression of sanctity, you know. So I saw the, uh, the Iron Dome question, and I want to speak to that. <clears throat> but first, I want to cover this whole aspect of um, the wicked governments. It says in the Handbook of Jewish Thought, chapter 19. Which one? Volume? Volume 2. It says, in general, the chain of events governing a person's economic fortunes is largely determined from the time of his conception. Um, besides this, however, each person is constantly judged and his financial fortunes determined over periods of time. God tries to satisfy the needs and wants of every creature. As the psalmist says, you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Psalm 145, 16. However, God knows what is ultimately best for each person, and he measures out their livelihoods accordingly. Uh, what page? 302. 302. And then I want to back up because there's a whole aspect about the government leaders. Uh, dun, dun, dun. That was 302. Oh, I look at all the sources, man, all this stuff to get my hands on. <laughs> This is a thing I wish I had tabbed. <laughs> Here we go. 311, page 311. It says, although each individual enjoys particular providence that extended to groups, institutions, and governments is more exacting. Accordingly, we are taught that the chain of events leading to changes in government are so precisely ordained by providence that the time of succession is determined to a hair's breadth. So when we look at governments and how they're set up, it's a very exacting process. It's like, it's no surprise about how governments happen because the whole providential system like there's never a person in place that shouldn't be in other words yeah actually back up to 1955 on 310 one of the important tasks of divine providence is maintaining a certain number of righteous individuals in each generation to ellie Malik's comment by their merit and example these individuals offer spiritual support to all humanity what are we doing offering spiritual support to those who need it like we're supposed to be doing mm -hmm. in order to assure that individuals will be born with both the heredity and environment, as well as the spiritual traits needed to be great spiritual leaders. God sets up chains of events, sometimes dating all the way back to Adam. Providence also arranges that before one saint dies, another is born. Someone always to take, take his place. 1956, the very statement that says, similarly, when God needs avengers, he causes individuals predisposed towards evil to be born. Regarding these, the psalmist says, the wicked are estranged from conception. Speakers of falsehood err from birth, Psalm 58, 4. So in other words, if we're not listening to Hashem, if we're in a place of hardening our hearts, turning away from righteousness, pursuing evil, walking after the lust of our flesh, Hashem's like, okay, cool. That's what you want to do. Let me put some wicked people in charge. 
And then when they get in charge, we're all like, no, that's a horrible person. I don't like it. Get them out of here. Shem's like, this is a wake up call. This is me knocking at the door going, are you going to listen to me? <laughs> <laughs> it's for repentance. I like the beginning of it. Although man has free will, certain individuals are predisposed by birth to be good. Accordingly, God told his prophet, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I sanctified you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And I just thought of Shaul. Yep. Similarly, when God needs Avengers, like you said, he causes individuals predisposed toward evil to be born. Let's see. What the? 295? Rashi Radak Ad Location Yoma 82B. Curious to what that says. I got that on there. It's got every piece of software going on my Mac here now. <laughs> oh, that's why you keep freezing up. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I got 16 gigs of RAM in this thing now. Okay, so. The best way to look at the Iron Dome, as opposed, uh, how was the question phrased? Regarding the beast kingdoms. And I think you're talking about the prophecies in Daniel, right? Where it talks about the statue. Uh, Daniel also talks about the four creatures that he saw, or the different creatures that he saw. So this is on page 44 in the future, bu future book. Okay, Brukashim, check this out. So the four exiles were seen by the prophet Daniel. He was one of the only people to know when the final messianic redemption would occur and was himself a part of the first exile. A what chapter? That's the chapter called the four exiles. Four. Chapter five, page 44. So each of the four kingdoms came to him in a vision in the form of terrifying creatures. So Belshazzar was king of Babylon. Um, when Daniel received these prophecies. Okay, so beast one. It says, this was uh, Babylon. It appeared like a lion with eagle wings. The lion was used as a metaphor because lions have tremendous power. The wings of the eagle represent great speed and energy by which the Babylonians were able to complete their conquest. Beast number two. This is the Persian exile, likened to a bear. Uh, this came out of the ocean. It says the Persians did not possess great power like the Babylonians, nor their agility, but were likened to a bear, which is not noted for great speed, but still powerful and copulent. The Persians were not regal like their predecessors, the Babylonians, therefore uh, not compared to a lion. In its mouth were three ribs. Each rib represented a different king. This was King Cyrus, King Akashverosh, and King Darius. Beast three. The Greek exile appeared like a leopard with four heads, as well as four wings growing out of its back. The leopard represented the distinguishing and brilliant reign of Alexander. Uh, the great who conquered most of Asia in a continuous swoop like a ferocious leopard. The speed by which Alexander the Great conquered so much territory in such a short time, being 12 years, took him 12 years to do that <laughs> during such a short lifespan because he died at 32. It says the four wings on his back, uh, which are like the four directions in which Alexander moved, after his death, there were four generals set up. This is Ptolemy, who took Egypt, Seleucus, who took Assyria and Babylon, 
Antigonus, who took Persia and Asia, and Philip, which was Alexander's brother, who took Macedonia. The Syrian Greeks overran Israel, defiled the temple. This is the Hanukkah story. Beast number four, the last beast, Roman exile, Daniel describes as excessively terrifying, awesome, strong, immense iron teeth and 10 horns. So it says the redundancy of the words terrifying and awesome corresponds to the double nature of the fourth kingdom. This is Christianity and Islam. In the vision, the beast ate and crumbled using large iron teeth symbolizing the rulers of Rome, which I think is interesting that the Iron Dome shoots down rockets. It shoots down attacks, like in this defensive maneuver. And uh, so the Iron Teeth symbolizing the rulers of Rome, the emperors who crushed and di di digested many other nations into themselves. The beast also trampled the rest with its feet. This represented the other nations that were not destroyed by the Roman Empire, but were instead brutally beaten into submission. Remember the Crusades? So yeah. these they went through like subjugating people by violence. So this is a whole aspect of what Daniel was talking about. What about the 10 horns? Each horn represented a different Roman emperor. Julius Caesar, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Galba, Otho, Vitellius, and Vespasian. During his father Vespasian's reign, Titus destroyed the second temple. Daniel continues his vision by examining the 10 horns and seeing another small horn coming up, which uprooted three of the previous. Who the small horn refers to is a matter of great debate. Some say this is Titus, others say this to be the papacy, although it would be many years until the Roman church would have the power to make its presence felt. Eventually the power of the church would rise up until the Middle Ages were able to challenge even the most powerful rulers. Others interpret this prophecy has not yet come true and is a reference to a nation that will one day convert to Islam and will come against the Christian world. So as far as those four beasts and what the iron statue and all that was all about, there you go. So that's chapter... Uh, Chapter five of the future, where it breaks all these things down. Hopefully that answers that question. Wow, well, we're really seeing that that could be, they say within the next, easily within the next generation where Islam is gonna take over uh, the Western nations just through sheer population. Yep, yep. And if you look at all the, the rise in halal food that's everywhere, yep. which means you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a place where I live called the halal guys and they're doing like these very uh, expanded and, and beautiful uh, advertisements putting up flyers everywhere and everybody's like what's the halal guys like what's mediterranean food like what is falafel and like all this kind of stuff and it's literally certified halal food that people are being like advertised and marketed to like hey you want this you should have this you should eat this and for people who don't understand kashrut or halal they're just like oh yeah sure you know and so if you think about you are what you eat, <laughs> you know, just becomes a thing where it's just so sad that, you know, there's a lack of education on that end and people are just naively, literally buying into that whole thing. So it wouldn't be any surprise that there is a rise in Islam because halal food is everywhere.
So I was going to mention in uh, Parsha Kitavo, which is in Deuteronomy, it's like 26, 27, 28. It talks about the fact if you don't um, uphold the, the law, there's a curse. Curse is anyone who doesn't uphold this law. If you don't serve Hashem and do the mitzvot with joy, it also is a curse for you. And this all takes us to Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. Curse is anyone who does not remain in everything written in the book of the law. You can see Deuteronomy 27, 26. And you can also see, what is the other verse? Chapter 28, verse 47 which says, since you did not serve God, your God, with joy and with heartfelt gladness when you had an abundance in everything, you will instead serve your enemies whom God will send against you. And it just goes on from there. Um, yeah, that is chapter... Yeah, that's chapter 28. So chapter 28 in Deuteronomy gives like the blessings and the curses. Library oot. So I want to read the commentary from who are they called? Uh, Strack and I have to read the, the source later. Okay. So the Targum says, curses everyone who does not uphold, which is fulfill the words of this Torah to do them. Cursed be the man who does not uphold the words of this Torah to do them. It says Leviticus Rabbah 25. When you come into the land and plant all kinds of trees for food, Leviticus 19.23. This is what is written. She, wisdom, equals Torah, is a tree of life for those who hold fast to it. Proverbs 3.18. Rabbi Huna said in the name of Rabbi Benyamin ben Levi, if it were said, cursed is everyone who does not study, there would be no continued existence for those who hate Israel, for the godless Israelites it gives some references for those. It says, but it says, curses everyone who does not uphold, which is establish or support the words of this Torah. Therefore, it is said, she is a tree of life for those who establish and strengthen her. Rabbi Huna said, if a person stumbles in sin and is guilty of death by God's hand, what should he do to remain alive? If he was used to reading one page in scripture, let him read two pages. If he was used to studying one chapter of the Mishnah, let him study two. If he was not used to reading in scripture or studying from the Mishnah, what then should he do to stay alive? Let him go and become a leader of the community or a raiser of charity and thus he will remain alive. For if it said cursed is whoever does not study, there would be no continuing existence for him. But it says cursed is everyone who does not uphold. And again, it quotes, she is a tree of life. For those who toil studying with her, there would be no continuing existence for one who neglects this, but it says she is a tree of life for those who establish her. Being under the protection of wisdom, which is occupying oneself with Torah, is like being under the protection of silver, the right use of money. Rabbi Aha said in the name of Rabbi Tanhum ben Hia, if a man has studied and taught and observed and practiced and done the Torah and was able to oppose evil and he did not oppose it, to establish the good, and he did not establish, behold, he is included and cursed. 
This is what it said, curse is whoever does not uphold, does not help strengthen or support. The slant of the passage pertains to the weakening in order to take away the sharpness of the curse. If a person is not a son of the Torah, let him support a teacher of the Torah. <laughs> and he will be worthy to remain alive. She, she is a tree of life to those who support her. So when we talk about the death of the Mashiach that removes the curse, let's see if uh, verse 13 talks about him becoming a curse for us. Curse is everyone who hangs on a tree, which by the way is from Deuteronomy uh, as well. Deuteronomy 21, 23, his corpse should not remain overnight on the tree, but rather you shall bury him on the same day since he had incurred guilt before God. He was hung on a tree. This is interpreted to mean flippant behavior against God. Desecration of God's divine name. And then it says, there's an idea that a person could become a curse of elimination or an atoning sacrifice for another person. So in other words, being able to take on our guilt, he, he drew that into himself. So it was as if our, uh, he was like our proxy, which is what the sacrifices are, by the way. So instead of us being seen as disobedient, uh, rebellious, and all of that, it's like this lamb is disobedient. This goat is rebellious. This bull, you know, is idolatrous as opposed to it being us. So the way that Mashiach removes the curse from us is because he became that curse for us. And why he specifically had to be put on a tree, the tree is the source of all of that. Because remember the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? That's what caused our fall. So it's all the way back to the source. So that's how his death removes the curse. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that was profound. So yeah, I've been wanting to uh, have time to put to put some of those pieces together and all night tour study perfect location. <laughs> yep. A tree. How did I not see that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we need the light, man. I was I went to the Talmud. Um, uh, what I read from the handbook, mm -hmm. uh, 1955. Um, I posted the note there from it, um, but it's on the Gemara in uh, Yoma 82b. With respect to a pregnant woman who smells food, it is told a certain pregnant woman smelled a food and craved it. Those involved came before Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi to ask how to proceed. He said to those who were inquiring, go and whisper to her that today is Yom Kippur. They whispered to her and this whispering helped. She stopped craving the food. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi read this verse about the baby she was carrying. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you, Jeremiah 1.5. And indeed, the baby who came out of that woman was Rabbi Yochanan. Uh, before I fo formed you, Baterem uh, at Zarka, Tosafet Yom HaKippurim writes that the main point of the verse is the last clause. And before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you, indicating that his mother's womb 
in his mother's womb, he was already sacred since he fasted on Yom Kippur, a similar story is related in the Jerusalem Talmud in which the following verse is cited, from my mother's womb, you are my God, Psalm 2211. See Saya Yitzhak. I thought about uh, Yochanan the Immerser just now. Nice. So the commentary I read from uh, was Strack and Billerbeck, commentary on the New Testament from the Talmud and Midrash. Oh. So, I'm at. Yes. I hear you talking about Avengers a lot. Yeah, that's what my thing. What is that about? <laughs> so, you know. this this whole thing, like when you uh, have uh, uh, metaphors, uh, allegories. Uh, me, I'm a very artistic person. I do poetry, I do music, I do dance. So like interpretation is totally like my thing. And so sometimes there's like, you can get a message from like a picture, like a picture is worth a thousand words, right? So for me, one of the most fascinating things to me is superheroes, like from Batman to Captain America, like all these different things. Well, I never really got into the comics, but I know of them a little bit, right? So all the movies that started coming out, you know, with the first Iron Man movie and all the way through the Avengers and all this kind of stuff, we were sitting around one Shabbat and just marveling. <laughs> and we, one of the, one of the people in the group was like, what if the superheroes were like Jews? Like, what if we had a Jewish Captain America, a Jewish uh, Iron Man, a Jewish Hulk? Like, what would they even look like? And instead of Captain America having the Star Spangled Banner, he had the Star of David. <laughs> you know, Iron Man's arc reactor had a Star of David in it. Uh, the Hulk, instead of being shirtless with the ripped pants, he had a, a Talit Katan <laughs> <laughs> on and like the uh, the big top hat with the payout coming out. And like, we just like Googled it and like they literally had these pictures on the web. And I was like, Jewish superheroes, oh my gosh. Well, you find out that like the writers of Superman, a lot of the Marvel uh, comic creators, they're all Jewish like it's all based off of jewish character arcs star trek's the same thing dude that's why i'm such a big fan of the show you know um, yeah so I mean, it's it's a know, thing. Go, go figure you know i mean <laughs> yeah so we just took the ball and ran with it so we was like so what would a jewish captain america be called oh captain israel <laughs> like what would a jewish iron man be called oh shomer man instead of iron man <laughs> the Incredible Hulk is the Incredible Talmud, which is the Incredible Disciple, <laughs> you know, and like it just started and it spun into like literally 80 people. <laughs> <laughs> and then the metaphor carried on further. When you look at the superpowers of each person, these are uh, gifts of the spirit that you have through studying Torah. So like, for instance, uh, me, I love the tech. I got named Iron Man. Like, I didn't choose it. <laughs> but I'm like, I'm always using technological devices for Torah. So i like, I had like eight phones because I kept getting a new phone, you know, every year with my upgrade and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, I'm not going to get rid of my old phone. I'm just going to upload a bunch of uh, Bible apps to it, you know, use it to take pictures so that when I run out of sources for people. I can give them the phone and it's got everything on it, you know? And it's like Iron Man was all about creating suits for people, you know, like what kind of tech do you need? What kind of weapons you need? Here you go, you know? And like, that was totally me. So I had like a bag with like two tablets, four phones, plus my own stuff, you know? 
and like we'll be sitting down studying and someone's like man I was reading something on the web you know and I pull out my phone and be like here go to it <laughs> you know <laughs> and it's like oh there we go you know Tony Stark over here and then um one guy who was the uh the Hulk he's the incredible talent he was always like flexing <laughs> Like every time he shares like an insight, he'd be like, ah, you know, and like roundhouse kick. And I'm like, I did not know the Hulk was into ninjutsu, but okay, I guess that works, you know, and like everyone like so fit their characters. And I'll talk about Shira because everybody knows Shira, right? Yeah. So she's Storm. <laughs> and the thing is, Storm has a crazy accent, right? <laughs> Like not bad, but like it's a different accent. She has that accent. I'm like, can you repeat what you just said? Because like sometimes you know you gotta like gotta like really listen. And then she always talks about like elements, right? Like she's like lightning, rain, thunder, snow, you know. And I'm like, seriously, lady, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So, um, and you should know by the way, Shlomo. He's, he said, like, no, I'm not doing the Avenger thing. He does the Avenger thing because every single time he, like, shares an insight. So Storm and the Black Panther had a, a child in the comics. And he was, like, this ridiculously outrageous character that, like, could do lightning and, like, all sorts of martial arts. And, like, every time Shomo Drashes, I'm like, yeah, that's him. <laughs> so... I'm just like, wow. But anyway, so it's like, it, it was just this big thing of like being able to see people's gifts and abilities. And as I have, uh, as I just kind of went with it, you know, like what if people that I knew were these superheroes? It's like, I start seeing people in a whole different way. So much so that I was able to see their Jewish name. I was able to see like, what would the character's name be if it's a Jewish person? you know, and start like naming out like Hawkeye, Hawkeyeen, because the letter I <laughs> is about the eyes, you know. I forgot so, the one you picked for me, but. Um. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, anyway, so it's like all this stuff. And so I'm just like, wow. But um, yeah, so that's where that came from. And that happened during the time of counting the Omer. <laughs> and I was like, what better way to make your fellow Torah study people beloved to you than see them as superheroes <laughs> and work together as a team. You want to talk about uh, tikkun and repentance? Because remember, the, the students of Rabbi Akiva died during the plague, but we know it's not necessarily that they were horrible to each other because what was Rabbi Akiva's main teaching? You know, do unto others as you would do unto yourself. Like the whole thing there, you know, so yeah, that's just where it kind of came from. So I talk about the Avengers because like I can just just the way people share their insights, the way they their personalities are, their their giftings and abilities. It's like I can see a whole other layer or dimension to who people are. And it's just like. Yeah, it's it's fun, you know, kind of thing, because you're supposed to have fun while you're studying Torah. So cracking jokes or having little, you know, little uh puns or things like that <laughs> are they're part of it and you actually find that you can absorb torah better that way because it's it like it resonates with you so for some people they can do it with colors they can do it with pictures they can do it with cars you know so you find kind of what speaks to you and and it'll take you even deeper into your insights so and for me, like I mentioned before, it just makes people cooler, you know, because I'm like, what's your ability? You know, because Iron Man is all about like looking at people and we're like, OK, so what's your skill set? Like what you do, what's your thing? And he's totally like a fan, like he cheers people on and stuff, you know, so. That's my story. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh, with me, it's science fiction. I've I've loved it since a kid, a kid. But <laughs> I kind of can't help but to mention the Expanse because 
another great science fiction show. And one of my favorite lines from that show is, suit up, strap in, prepare for a high G burn, man. Full throttle on the Rosinante, man. We're going for the rings. <laughs> oh, my goodness, man. Proto Molecule. That just blew me away. I was like, how they come up with this stuff? This, I mean, it's amazing, you know? You got to break down these terms you're mentioning. Proto Molecule, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> it, it's a made-up term. I mean, it's, it's specific to the show, but... The way they describe it is that this is a, an, a molecule that can repurpose anything it comes in contact with. So think about the Torah in that respect. The Torah can repurpose anything it comes in contact with, meaning the like, Torah Psalm 19, 8, like Psalm 19.8 says, and the Torah of Adonai is perfect, doing what? Restoring the soul bringing you back to the way of Hashem. And then this episode in the third season comes up where this ring opens up in the solar system and you go inside the ring space and where do you see these other rings to like 1,400 other systems? And I thought of, oh my goodness, the Sephiro, within Sephiro, within Sephiro, and I just dropped into this totally mystical state. I mean, oh, man. Because <laughs> then you have these proto-molecule builders who built entire civilizations with this stuff. Because in the fourth season, the crew of the Rosie goes to investigate this planet where there's uh, evidence of proto-molecule activity, but unfortunately, you know, belters start mining the the planet you know not knowing what's there you know all they care about is their material things you know and then you know james holden's got uh josephus miller stuck in his head because of the proto molecule <laughs> only he can see him only he can hear him you know and it's driving everyone else on the rosy nuts you know and finally they start getting used to it and then miller shows him how to shut down everything on on this planet, all the proto molecule activity, you know, and you know, there, there's there's some depth to this show. It just really drew me in, and I thought of certain Kabbalistic principles, you know, and it just sucked me in. And I'm like, man, this is like an aspect of the Torah that I'm just like go for, you know. I just this is why I love the Kabbalah. I, I embrace it, you know. I Part of my testimony is my first years in the church, I read the Bible through every year five times. I got, I got the Tanakh in here, which is one of the prerequisites for Kabbalah. That's part of the halakha of studying Kabbalah. And also you need to know the Talmud. So I'm really getting into Talmudic study, you know, that as well. And so that those two things really opened the door. But, you know, Movies like, oh boy, <laughs> this is kind of taking me back, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Oh man. I mean, where Bowman leaves the discovery and he's taken down this like rabbit hole, so to speak. And you see all this psychedelic stuff going by and it's like, oh my goodness, man, what am I doing here? <laughs> where am I going, man? You're like traveling hundreds of millions of light years, you know? out of the solar system like that in that movie interstellar with the wormhole mm -hmm. you know the mind-blowing part of that movie is when uh, cooper uh takes the ranger into the black hole and he's not destroyed i'm like wait a minute this is the most destructive force in the entire universe you would be atomized even before you got to the accretion disk of the black hole because of the matter that these things pull in, it emits gamma radiation so intense that you would be fried. There would be nothing left of you. But he goes in, everything goes black. The ship falls apart because of the gravity, but then he's left alive. And what does he come across? A tesseract, a hypercube. 
And what is described in the Kabbalah of the Adamic Messiah regarding the consciousness of Hashem? He's the super consciousness. And we are, and our consciousness as part is supposed to be part of Adam Kadmon, which is part of the super consciousness, the hypercube, which you know is it's endless. It, think of it as ain't self. There's no beginning, there's no end. A A Asher A A. Has no beginning, no end. This is what the four letter name points to the timelessness of Hashem. That's it. We're, we're in the place that he created, the place that is with him, that is maintained. You know, and he, what he's doing with us, he's like the proto molecule in the expanse, he's repurposing us back to that consciousness. That was a Dom Kadmon before he descended down to the knowledge of good and evil. You know, see, this is what I see happening. Um, and I have this documentary called uh, um, Evan Shetia, the Foundation Stone. This stuff would just blow your mind. I mean, some of the stuff that's uncovered in this. Um, that there's this stone inside the Al Aqsa Mosque that was present in the first and second Beit Hamikdash that stood on the very same place. This is one of the big reasons why the Muslims do not want the Jewish people to rebuild the third temple. They don't because of the foundation stone. This is huge mystically because the Kabbalist rabbis in Israel speak of a time of tohu vebohu that's coming. What you, this reality that you see before us right now is not the reality that was supposed to be, but rather what the Torah shows us. That's the reality of creation that Hashem originally intended when he created the heavens and the earth. Not what we have now. We're, we've been hijacked, so to speak, by the Satan, by the, the Nakash when he infected Hava with the poison, with this virus, if you will, like a Trojan horse virus that just totally hijacks the system. And now you see this reality that man's creating for himself, which is separate and distinct from the will of, a, of Hashem, his original intent, because we weren't supposed to be like this at all. That's the interesting thing. The Torah doesn't explicitly use the phrase olam haba because it doesn't need to because all the mitzvot describe olam haba what we would be doing within olam haba because all the mitzvot are like a integrated web they're integrated so much that just not doing one unravels all the others it just this, it just warps the reality that Hashem originally created. And we just keep getting more and more astray, which is why anything that's, any thoughts that are contrary, any actions we take form worlds in, this, in the spiritual realms, and thereby creating realities here that are just simply not supposed to be. You know, and this is what the master came to show us the way back to Gan Eden. That's This is his whole reason for coming. It's not just to save our souls because it's to rectify the whole of creation, not just us, because we are cr the creation as well. But we have a free will. We have a an intellect, a will of our own. But we have to actively be choosing to do what Hashem created us to do despite the fact that we got this, this war going on inside of us between the Yetzer Hara and the Yetzer Tov, you know? Because that's part of the prayers in the morning. May I, may I be attached to your commandments and may the Yetzer Tov have the dominance, you know? Mm -hmm. To do your will, you know, in the face of all those who see me, you know? It's... Uh, Oh, Ellie Melick saying an interstellar one hour equals seven years on Earth. <laughs> you know, not to brag or anything, but 
looking outside, I see some daylight. Yeah, I'm beginning to see that too. <laughs> How's it looking uh, for Shauna, Ellie, Malik? How y'all doing? Y'all see daylight yet? Oh no, not at all. It's pitch black. Almost there. Yeah, that's basically my uh, testimony. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, often think of the cosmos, like the universe and constellations when I think of the Kabbalah. Because <laughs> all of those firots are uh, worlds. Because there's so, worlds, like there's... Like each sphera contains all the other ones. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Like, it's layered like an onion, basically. So each circle, there's like at least 10 in those. Because there's 10 sphero total, right? But if you took one of the sphero, there's 10 sphero inside of one. So there's 10 tens. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take, Do you see okay. The look. Um, yeah, I'm gonna get a picture for you. I have seen the picture. But I just don't understand it. Gotcha. It's okay. It it just takes time. Like, um, take one. So if you're, let's start. Let's just do do Kater. No, we got to do a picture, bro. <laughs> yeah. I, I okay, but think of it this way: you're zooming in on that one Sephiro, and when you zoomed in enough, you begin to see the others that are within it. Oh gosh, Think this is gonna get crazy. I just got, I've never seen it. <laughs> yeah, it keeps going. Um, have you ever seen that painting, the, uh, the artist painting a picture of an artist painting a picture of an artist painting a picture of an artist painting a picture? Yeah. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Okay, so use that as a template for the Sephiro. There's Kater within Kater, within Kater, within Kater, and so forth. Hey, oh. Okay. Um, are you familiar with uh, Mandelbrot geometry? Mandelbrot fractals. Yeah, yeah Mandelbrot uh, fractals. Don't you ever hear that? Uh, no, this? I was just saying that if you ever had a mirror behind you and one in front of you keeps going, keeps going. That's a good way to explain it. Yeah. That, the reason why I said that is because I used to see that when I was a child, right? Because we literally had one mirror in front, one mirror in the back. I think my dad liked looking in mirrors, but. <laughs> Let me say this. Tennis, we wrote. Uh, I'm very visual. <laughs> and I'm trying to see if I can find a picture because I've seen one before. But I'm just going to go to this one. Open image and a new tab. Oh. This is going to be over the top. I'm just going to let everybody know right now. <laughs> Ed's up. Look at this. <laughs> so I don't know if y'all can see this, but you have 10 spheroid. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine ten, right? So these are normally one circle. Well, inside of each circle is a uh, ten circles. So Keter includes this, 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 this. So take all of these other nine and put them inside of here. Yeah. Then go over here, take all the other nine, Put them inside of there. 
So each one is basically like nested. Like when you open a file folder on your computer, you open that folder, there's like 10 folders in there, open that folder, 10 folders in there. That's the spherotes and those are called worlds. Also, you should know that the 10, C, 10 spherotes go with the four worlds. Are you saying worlds? Yes. There's yeah, the that four one. worlds that correspond to the four letters of Hashem's name, Atzilut, which is um, apparently connected to fire. Oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. That is Gabura. <laughs> um, this is like each of these words, like uh, essence, creation, formation, action, is like archetype, creative, formative, manifest. So in each of the worlds is a whole <laughs> set of tense we wrote. So these correspond to Hashem's four letter name. And so you'll take this, stack it on top of here, stack it on top of there. So it'll kind of look like this. Where the bottom is actually yeah. the top of the next one down. So these are four worlds. This represents four yeah. years of That's coming down. Order. Oh, here's a better picture of it. You stack them. <laughs> That's the one I was just talking about. <laughs> I was good. I was telling my husband pull up that one, but I forgot that was you <laughs> yeah. controlling then, the mouse. There. Yeah. So ultimately, there we go. This, this is the picture where each ten is inside of each one of the ten. Cool. Yeah. And this is stacked down. In four, uh, four orders, or four worlds. So there's worlds inside of worlds, dimensions inside of dimensions. So like we have this galaxy, another galaxy, another galaxy, all of that. On planet Earth, we have like the different uh, countries, the different uh, continents, all of that kind of stuff. You go to another planet, you'll find all of that you know, all the things that are uh, involved in each one. They also correspond to the parts of the human body where Keter is above our head, like a crown um, to the right side of us and to the left side of us above our head is the wisdom and the understanding. You have Da'at, which is our brain, Malkut. Uh, they have it here as our mouth. Malkut is your mouth. Um, Chesed and Gavura, these are your two arms. Uh, Netzach Yesod, these are your two legs. Yesod is the procreative organ. Um, what else can we show you? Oh, yeah. And if you put the letters of Hashem's name together on top of each other, like the Kabbalah, uh, Sfirot that we were talking about, stacking them, it makes the body of a person. It looks like a human being. Oh, wow. So. Oh, yeah, the Mishkan. Uh, here's another layer of it. You can draw circles within those circles. I just dropped a link for YQ1 because it really gets into it. Um, Come up with this. Yeah, this is the mystical Kabbalah that comes from, um, uh, as some sources say, Abraham. Uh, the works of creation, which is Sefri Yitzira. You also have, that's called the Book of Formation, Sefri Yitzira. Uh, this was said to be a uh, tradition from Abraham. Uh, you also have the working of the chariot, which is what we saw when the sea split. Uh, chapter one of Ezekiel. Yeah. So they talk um, about like different systems. Also have... They correspond to different colors. So colors play a role in this. The blue is red, blue is Hased. Um, Apparently the menorah <laughs> can be mapped out as Sfirot. <laughs> um, if you know of Rabbi Trugman's youtube channel he has a whole series on introduction to kabbalah where he goes over the spherot you can also turn it into an actual tree because the 
spherot or an actual tree. And here's something. Let's see here. Uh, where did I put that picture? I have a picture I'm going to share with everybody about the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because they're also the Spiro. So check this out. This is from uh, Rebid Zine, Yehud, uh, Sarah Yehudit Schneider. So here's your Spiro. You see them? Yep. And these Hebrew letters are the first letter of each of the Spiro, like Keter, Chokma, Bina, Dot. So here's the tree of life. This is the root because the uh, everything in in uh, the upper worlds is upside down. This is why in order to go up, you got to go down, right? So tomato plants, topsy-turvy, those kinds of things. Well, the tree of life is a root system for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is upside down. It's That's where the branches and the fruit are. These are the lower spirit that we actually count that correspond to the emotional makeup of a person. This is what we counted as we counted the Omer. So we talked about chesed, sheb, malkut, you know, kindness of kingdom, you know, and things like that. So chok mabina dot, notice we don't count those. Those are higher levels of intellect. And that's up in the higher uh, aspect of things. So that is the root of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is the tree of life. Notice how we focused on the tree of life and abandoned, or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden, as opposed to the tree of life. Like what gives rise to the emotions is our intellect, but our emotions are like stronger than our intellect sometimes. Sometimes we can know we shouldn't do something, but like our emotions, we get carried away and we stop thinking, you know? <laughs> And so it's like we uproot the tree kind of thing. But if we focus on the root of things, this is where the Omer count comes in because it's helping us go, okay, let's really look at what rectifies our emotions. And so you can see the tree of life versus the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's connected to the spirit, which is an upside down tree. So if you flip it over, uh, it looks like this, and this is something Devorah did. She took the image and flipped it over. I was like, okay. So if you flip it, it looks like this. Which to me, I, I think is much more comprehensible because it's like it's right side up. <laughs> so you can see it right there where Malkut is on top, Keter is on bottom. So anyway, but those are just like different uh, visuals that you can look at for the spirit. So when Shlomo was just talking a minute ago about like the expanse, the protomolecule, the different uh, gates and things that people can go through the rings, you know, that's, that's the spirit. That's the Kabbalah. So when you read the Zohar, it talks about Shekinah, it talks about Zeranpin, Zeranpin, it talks about uh, Nukva, it talks about Teferit. It's using basically all of those uh, circles that we were just showing. And it's talking about the unifications connecting those dots or circles, shall we say. So if you're engaging in the counting of the Omer, like on a deep spiritual level, you are practicing Kabbalah. Yeah. Like the way the app has been showing us in the book uh, Rabbi Trugman's been posting, it, it's teaching everybody Kabbalah. <laughs> right. I posted a link to uh, an article on Waikiwan and they have a lot on it. Um, yeah. But um First time I saw the Spirot, I was in anime. I was in an anime call 
full metal alchemist. That's what Ellie Malik just posted. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, thank you. He's like, you got a question about that, right? <laughs> um, yeah, this article goes into pretty much see uh, it covers the Ten Sefiro and Cordovarian Kabbalah Lurianic, which is the Ari Cordovarian's Moshe Cordovero, the Spanish Kabbalist. Names which emerge after Sefer Yetzira and their interinclusion. Then you have the three configurations: circles, Igulim, upright Yosher, and uh, man Ish. And then the man metaphor in Kabbalah. Soul faculties and female male principles. Um, like Adam Carmon is androgynous, based on the verse Adam in Genesis Carmon. where, and he, yes, based on the verse in Genesis where it says, and he created him male and female. We're talking about the primordial Adam, yeah, the Adam Carmon. So the higher Adam, yeah, the upper Adam. Weird, hey? <laughs> well, it's similar to Atik Yomin. That phrase you see in Daniel, that means the ancient of days. So that's another very mystical term in reference to uh, Hashem. He's the ancient of days, and it's strictly metaphorical. Um actually there's this prayer um adon alam which part of it says you know and who reigned before any form created and after all has ceased to be you alone will reign in splendor tiferet making reference to the sephira of tiferet which is splendor it's a really beautiful prayer. It's my wife's favorite. She loves it. Um, but the other aspect of the Sephira, maybe if I could share my screen, that way I could show her. You should be able to. Okay, can you see it? Yeah, I'm just zooming in. Okay, right here. Yeah. Okay, it also in Kabbalah that Hashem um, created the universe, the heaven and the earth through 32 paths of wisdom. That means the 22 letters of the Aleph Bait from Aleph to Tav, which are represented. If you can see the lines that are interconnecting each of the Sephira, those are the 22 paths of wisdom. And then you have the 10 Sephira themselves, which is 32 paths of wisdom. And the division of the Sephira, the first three are the divine intellect or the super conscious will. And then when we count Da'at, we do not count Keter, because Da'at's inferred. And then we move down to the six. And I explained previously that this is what's known as uh, Zer Anpin, the short countenance or short face, consisting of Hased, Gavur, Tiferet, Netzach, Yesod. And then Malkut basically is on its own, but it derives all of its. It doesn't exist on its own necessarily, but it derives its um, life from all the others. Like one thing about Binah, it's 
because it's on the site of Ema, which is Gevura, it gives birth to all the others. It gives birth to Hased, Gevura, Tiferet, Netzach, Kohen, and Yesod, and Malkut. Okay. And you know, yeah, and you notice in each of these connecting lines, you see each of the OTO or the letters of the Aleph Bet. Mm -hmm. These are the 22 connections or paths of wisdom. But this is one of the emanations in Kabbalah of Ein Sov. Previous to this emanation of the Sephiro is Adam Kadmon. Previous to that, is Zim Soon. Previous to that is Or Ein Sof. Previous to that is Ein Sof. Yeah, I don't know what any of those terms mean. Though. Ein Sof means the infinite nothing. It's incomprehensible. Us as a physical creation, it is beyond our ability to grasp. Um, I mean, I could get out Daniel C. Matt's book, The Essential Kabbalah, and I could read a certain section from it which well, you just have to yeah just have to break it down to yeah the simple terminology of when we talk about ain so we're just basically talking about outside of what we can conceive as a thought i mean no thought can grasp the right. infinite one blessed be he because um like yeshua said in john 4 God is that spirit. They that it's worship him must. Like you can't put, you can't describe it. It's there, In other words, there's no adjective that can describe him. In other words, you know, when you try to put God in a box and say, okay, this is what he is. No, it is. He isn't. There, I mean, he's indescribable. Basically, because, the way they put it is the moment you begin to try to say or uh, give a, a, <clears throat> a description, that's when you've already lost. <laughs> like you've, you've lost the understanding at that point. So that's basically what he's about to read. I, did, I took a screenshot. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it later. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's huge. And it's, I mean, again, this isn't even, uh, a, a good way to really enter into it which is why again i encourage go to rabbi trugman's uh classes because he's doing a great job of introducing kabbalah because there's you have to be licensed uh and authorized to teach kabbalah like yeah. you don't teach kabbalah to the masses and you know a person who is a teacher of kabbalah you have to have a person who has taught you who has taught them you know it's it's a long link chain. You don't just go, oh, I'm studying Kabbalah. Let me teach you, you know. And, and wouldn't you need a foundation in which you would want to even start learning? Right. Yeah, and I so mentioned it earlier. Yeah. Um, so probably not there yet. No. And this is why uh, it's good to chalk up this last section of what we've been talking about. It's just a show and tell but not really uh, educational to take to the bank and be like, this is exactly what it is. It's nothing different, you know, because mm -hmm. who are we? <laughs> I mean, this is stuff that I've been mulling over for decades. So let me ask you guys a question. Um, so you're, do you find the counting of the Omer transformative? Oh yeah. Yeah. This, this year was the first year that I started to do the devotions mm -hmm. and I'm following Rabbi Anava's mm -hmm. devotion. Mm -hmm. And I've experienced a lot of transformation this year. And I, and I know I'm just scratching, like I, I barely understood what I was even learning. Oh, yeah. Teach like, yourself. <laughs> like you're, you're whipping through every single day so quickly you don't even have time to really you know no nope, you don't <laughs> and, but even so i noticed a big change i was blown away 
And then, so it makes me wonder, like for you guys who understand it so much better. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, here's a brief explanation on this site where on in so literally, yeah, it, literally without in. It's an important concept in Jewish Kabbalah, generally translated as infinity and endless. The Insof represents the formless state of the universe before self-materialization of God. In other words, the Ein Sof is God before he decided to become God as we know him. Mm. The Sephiro are divine emanations that come from the Ein Sof, any manner often described as a flame. The Sephiro emanate from above to below. As the first Sephira is closest to Ain Sof, it is the least comprehensible to the human mind. That would be Keter, the divine will, or the superconscious will. While in turn, the last is the best understood because it is closest to the material world that humanity dwells on, that being us, this physical space of creation. Now, Daniel C. Matt in his book, The Essential Kabbalah, Right, and it's on page 66. The inner power is called Ayin because thought does not grasp it, nor reflection. Concerning this, Job said, wisdom comes into being out of Ayin. And then he goes on this, goes on, the depth of primordial being is called boundless because of its concealment from all creatures above and below. It is also called nothingness. If one asks, what is it? The answer is nothing, meaning no one can understand anything about it. It is negated of every conception. No one can know anything about it except the belief that it exists. Its existence cannot be grasped by anyone other than it. Therefore, its name is I am becoming or Asher, Aye, Asher, I will be who I will be. This is what Hashem said to Moshe on Har Sinai. And that's what Yeshua said, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, heard. no mm -hmm. believed what God has in store for those who love him. Is that what he's referring to? Actually, that's uh, Shaul in Romans. Oh. Okay. But point, but point taken, though. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's everything after the uh, the arrival of the Mashiach in the third temple, because we only know up to Mashiach's arrival, the resurrection. After that, we don't know. Like as we get into the uh, ninth thousand, eight thousand years, nine thousand years, ten thousand years, eleven thousand. Like we don't know anything about that. <laughs> Okay, I'm full. Okay, awesome. I'm not Is it over daylight over there? <laughs> Got any? Oh, maybe a little bit. What time is it now? Laura, do you see any light? Oh. Canada. But, oh, um, yeah, this is a good article to start with. I put it up in the chat, the link for it. So, you know, okay. just, when it comes to Kabbalah, take your time. Don't, yeah, I'm, please, don't be in, in a hurry. Just I, take it bits <laughs> at a time. I just didn't even realize the counting of the Omer was Kabbalah. Yeah, yeah I mean, it is. Um, well, the word Sephiro singular and sephira plural literally means counting mm. enumeration but early kabbalists presented a number of other entomological possibilities from the same hebrew root including safer text which also means book sapur recounting a story sapir or sapphire brilliance luminary 
Safar, Boundary, and Sofer, or Safra, Scribe. The term Safira thus has complex connotations within Kabbalah. Okay. Hey, what time is it there, Shauna? Um, 422. And apparently it's going to get light at 5. Sweet. Well, you have passed dawn. So uh, you are all set for all night tour study. <laughs> Baruch Hashem, everyone. Well, you guys are way past. Yeah, we are. We want to stick around for y'all. Oh, you guys are awesome. Well, it's been fun, but we got a service in a few hours. I want to try to take a short nap. <laughs> so. Yeah. So All right. Hog Shavuot Sameach and have a wonderful Yom Tov. Thank yep. you. Well, I'll be Thank watching the live stream. <laughs>